Welcome to another episode of Submission Radio. It's October 19th. I'm Dennis Skrata. I'm here with Kasper Ozalowski. We have a fun show for you here today, folks. We have tons of fun and tons of guests. We've got four badass guests for you this week, and they are none other than Martin Campman, Ben Saunders, Stefan Bonner, and the man who will be taking on Rory McDonald at Metamoris 5. That's right, JT Torres will be on the show. I'm excited. There's a ton of questions. Uh, we're not messing around today. We're getting straight into it. Four interviews, four guests. It's going to be a big one. That's right, guys. A bit of housekeeping for everybody here at home listening right now. YouTube.com forward slash Submission Radio AU is where all the interviews, the past interviews, the past episodes are. You guys are free to go on there at any time. Check out our exclusive interview with Vandalay Silver. We've got some fun videos coming up as well, don't we, Cass? Absolutely. And don't forget, guys, if you don't have the time to sit here on YouTube in front of your computer, jump on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio. I think we're pretty much on any podcasting platform there is. The show is out there and it is where most of our listeners are. If you do enjoy the show, obviously don't forget to subscribe and just know that we are officially part of the SB Nation Network. So a big shout out to SB Nation and all their fantastic sites like MMA Fighting, Bloody Elbow and MMA Mania. That's right, guys. And, you know, we've got a Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash submission radio AUS. We love the interaction. You know, we get a bunch of messages every week. So jump on there, like us and shoot us your message. Tell us what you think of the show or any other questions that you have. We always love hearing from the fans and obviously, you know, love interacting with you guys. So, you know, don't forget that. And obviously the Twitter, which is the Twitter, which is where all the action <laughs> happens at submission AUS. Some hilarious photos coming out throughout the week. And, you know, some, a, a, a bit of a... A bit of a pleasure of ours, you know, uh, tweeting out with the fans and having a bit of fun. So if you're looking to have a bit of fun with Submission Radio, follow us now and <laughs> get into the conversation with us. We have a lot to say usually. And you know what? Uh, just before we kick into our first interview, you reminded me. Uh, coming this week, Kyle Noak. We caught up with Kyle Noak just the other day. Had an awesome interview with him. Had a lot of fun. We asked him some fun questions. And we talked to Kyle Noak about choosing a new nickname and choosing his new look. So check that out. That's going to be exclusive to the YouTube channel the next couple of days uh, without further ado guys time for our guest the order of course will be Ben Saunders Martin Camp and afterwards uh, Stefan Bonner and then JT Torres but for now it's time for our first guest our next guest is an MMA veteran who was a part of the classic Tough Service Hughes series and recently made his return to the UFC becoming a part of the history books as the first person to finish his opponent with an omoplata in the UFC he now fights Joe Riggs at UFC on Fox 13 December 13th Let's welcome Ben Killer B. Saunders to the program. Ben, welcome to Submission Radio. No, thanks, guys. Thank you uh, for having me. Very happy to be here. Well, it's, a lot. it's our absolute pleasure, Ben. Now, it's been a couple of months since your performance of the night. I'm a part of finish. What have you been up to since your big return fight to the UFC? Uh, man, I took about two weeks off just to kind of like, you know, relax and uh, kind of soak everything in and then just you know, got right back to work, man. Um, you know, down south at Coconut Creek, uh, American Top Team headquarters, and uh, just preparing, you know, for my next fight while, you know, just trying to refine my skills, you know, learn, and, uh, you know, constantly just be a martial artist, a student of the game, you know, no one's ever going to be uh, the best, they, you know, that they, you know, can be. Mm. Um, there's always something you can refine, always something you can you know, add to your, to your game or to your, to your arsenal. And, uh, I'm just constantly, uh, trying to improve the best I can, man. It's a, uh, it's a rough game fight in the UFC, man. You're going to be fighting <laughs> some monsters. So I definitely want to make sure that I, I keep getting better. And, uh, you know, I'm at the top of my game. Well, it's certainly no badminton tournament, that's for sure. No disrespect to badminton, but um, you know, let's let's talk about your training, Ben. Obviously, you know, you're down there at ATT American Top Team, one of the premier fight camps, um, you know, in in all of MMA. What are some of the things that you have been working on, especially when you got a guy like Joe Riggs that you'll be facing uh, December thirteenth? Uh, honestly, man, just working on everything, trying to you know, uh, you know, be aware of uh, obviously some strengths. And, uh, and weaknesses that he might have in his game. But above all, you know, uh, just concentrating more on my game and uh, how I'm going to kind of implement my game uh, throughout the fight and uh, refine my skills and, and just be, uh, 
become better all around. You know, he he's a tough he's a tough dude, man. He he's <laughs> he's a huge veteran, mm. and uh, in in fact, as you know, if you look at his record and how long he's been fighting, I mean, the dude's pretty much a pioneer mm. <laughs> with the sport. So you know, I got nothing nothing but respect for him. Uh, he's returned the respect towards me, and uh, you know, we're we're just gonna we're gonna go out and you know put everything on the line and. Uh, you know, try to make it entertaining for the, you know, for the fans and, uh, you know, try to <laughs> try to cement our legacies, you know, one, one fight at a time. Wow, that has all the makings of a very exciting fight. And Ben, before we get to your uh, amazing UFC return and to the big fight that you have coming up on UFC Fox 13, we want to go back in time. We want to jump into the time machine. We want to go back to 2007 when you were on, the, on, your, on your season of The Ultimate Fighter. You were a part of Team Sarah. Many fans remember that season as one of the best. Tell us, um, you know, you're, you're a, a lot younger. You're a different Ben Saunders. Tell us about your experience on that show. Honestly, man, like, uh, obviously going into the show, we were the sixth season, so there were five seasons before. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm young. I'm like, I just turned 24 years old pretty much, and uh, I just remember looking at the situation of this is life-changing. This is the greatest opportunity I've ever experienced and may ever experience in my life, so I might as well take as much advantage of it as possible, but above all, I saw it as like a, a vacation, a really, really high quality like uh, MMA camp, you know, <laughs> and, and 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 I'm there training with the the champion of my weight class and that Sarah. Um, I mean, it was a crazy, you know, couple of weeks being out there, and obviously, you know, it can get a little stressful and um, and all that. But above all, man, I mean, we had a pretty cordial cordial season so i don't know if it, if it was as entertaining from the crazy things that happened at the house uh but you know uh i i definitely think that uh for, for the most part i enjoyed my time there some 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 people didn't um you know i i think when it comes to tough uh it also the you know the age where you are in your career and if you have children and wives at the time definitely connect with you know uh your time in the house i guess i was fortunate i was young i didn't have any of that uh to really to really deal with too much uh so i was just along for the ride man i i, I really enjoyed it <laughs> it worked out very well for my career <laughs> <laughs> now in terms of your career you know, after your first fight the ultimate fight finale you know you had a strong following for the next three years in the ufc before you moved on to bellator you know looking back at yourself then and now what are some of the key differences that you notice uh what between how i fight now and then or just experience knowledge what do you mean i mean i get i guess both yeah I, I mean, I'm definitely a lot wiser, <laughs> a lot more intelligent. Um, you know, I, I, I know for a fact. You know, I was just a hard nosed kid. You know, even even when I may have lacked uh, some some skill or talent from being so young, I made up for it with heart, determination, and just mm. <laughs> a guy that would just you know bite on his mouthpiece and not care and step into the pocket and just trade mm. you know like i didn't care it, like i i used to be a you know uh a lot a, a pretty reckless star like i i like to use my range but i also was a fan of just you know getting in there if i have to take a shot to give a shot yeah not really care so much and uh obviously you know you try to improve you try to become a more intelligent fighter over the years um if you're not then your career potentially won't last very long so you know i've definitely i definitely consider myself an intelligent uh student of the game and uh all around man i i, I think just all my skills now like i look back on I, I i i'm surprised at myself i'm like i can't believe i did so damn good considering <laughs> how green i was you know like <clears throat> I, I only had four wins to my name when i went on the show you know, so it was like, yeah, I'm going in the UFC. My first fight in the UFC ever, you know, is uh, uh, is my fifth win ever in, in my career. That's that's pretty pretty gnarly, pretty crazy. Mm. So it was kind of a uh, believe in yourself on the way. You know, I knew what I was capable of, but at the same time, you know, uh, it is the UFC. <laughs> yeah. 
Of course, you know, and speaking about that, Ben, you know, like you mentioned, a lot of top competition there. You were very young, and there was a moment there where you and the UFC, you know, parted ways and you went on to Bellator. And, you know, you sound like you were a very strong minded person. I'm just wondering when that first moment happened when you and the UFC parted ways. Did you think that you were going to make it back into the company? What was going through your head? It, it's, it's a very tough time in a lot of fighters' lives. Um, honestly, it really, I didn't take it too bad. I didn't take it too bad. I felt like I was in good with the company. You know, I, I, uh, I, I felt in good relations with them all. And it was just basically, uh, you know, my, at the time, my, my wrestling or takedown defense wasn't, wasn't on par with what they wanted because at the time, if you look back in time to what the welterweight division was like in 2010, it was overrun by wrestlers. Mm -hmm. it, it like, and not necessarily saying that we don't have wrestlers now, but if you look at it, it's, it, you know, there's, uh, there's definitely GSP's not even in the picture. So it's crazy. So it's yeah. like, you know, there, there's a big, yeah, there's a big, there's a big change to uh, what the top 10 are and uh, who the title contenders are. And obviously the champ is now. Um, there's just been a, a lot that has happened in, in that, you know, four years. But when they let me go, it was pretty much back then. Over on with wrestlers, I needed to get better at takedown defense. I needed to get better at wrestling. I needed to get better all around. My offense off my back needed to improve. You know, I, I, I was able, I took it very, uh, very well. It was just like everything you're saying, I completely agree with. I completely understand and I'm going to work on it. And I did. I just, uh, <laughs> I didn't think it was going to take four years, but that kind of just came down to, uh, you know, the way things worked out with Bellator and, you know, contracts and everything. And uh, it is what it is, man. I got to uh, get a lot of experience with Bellator and, um, you know, kind of kind of really refine who I am as a fighter um, and, and, and get that experience that I needed to come back and, you know, now I'm looking to uh, to just kind of showcase, you know, the the improved version of me. The new Ben Saunders. Just quickly, Ben, you know, on Bellator, when you were there, you obviously gained a lot of new fans. You know, you were the season five and season eight runner-up in the welterweight tournament. How did you enjoy your experience with the company? Um, for the most part, man. I mean, they have a lot of uh, – all the, all the fighters there, man. Everyone on the roster was great. They got a lot of great people also that work and run the company. Um, you know, uh, for the most part, man, looking back on it, I'm just like, you know, I, I guess I can say I was blessed to, uh, have it, you know, ha have experienced what I was able to experience and go through all over there. You know, obviously there were some hardships and there were some, some, some good times and some bad times, but, uh, you know, I'm, I, I try too much, you know, I try not to think of any of the negative stuff too much anymore, man. I, I, I'm kind of on a, a nice uh, um, a cloud right now. Be there. So realistically, man, I look back and I'm like, well, everything I did in Bellator got me to where I am today. So I'm, you know, I gotta say I'm very, uh, very grateful. Oh, absolutely, Ben. You know, that that's a great mindset there. And I was just wondering, you know, uh, there were some big changes made with Scott Coker coming in as the new president of the company. Um, what do you think about that? Do you think that it's uh, going to push the company into the right direction? And what do you think about some of the moves the company has made sort of over the last few months with Scott in charge? I don't think it's been great, man. I think, it, I think it's a phenomenal move on their part. I, I hear nothing but great things about Scott Coker. And uh, I, I believe just in general, the direction they're kind of going in, I think they're getting, they're also getting rid of the tournament formats. I, I you know, I, I could be wrong that that may just be not got any confirmation on whether or not that's accurate, but it seems to be uh, the word going around. And, uh, you know, so it seems like they're changing things up and, um, you know, I got to say, man, above all, just the fact that, there might not be as much of a fight going on anymore between UFC and Bellator with Scott Coker taking over is probably the best uh, improvement I can think about that. Because when I, when I did go with Bellator, originally there was nothing. There was no issues between UFC and Bellator. And then it kind of, <laughs> and then 
things kind of got crazy, and I was like, oh, man, this, like, this kind of sucks because I want to go with the USC, so I don't know what this is going to mean for me. And uh, But now it seems like, you know, they all respect each other. Scott Coker is, uh, seems to be in, in, in good lights with, uh, you know, the powers that be at the UFC. So, you know, that's another I, – I think MMA, you know, the more organizations, the better – uh, we got a lot of talent, a lot of fighters that need uh need salaries, man. They need to make you know a living, and uh, you know the more the merrier, in my opinion. That's a really great point. And uh, just you know, one more thing on you know in terms of Bellator and the UFC. And I'm curious, as a guy who's obviously fought for both companies, what would you say the biggest difference is between fighting for Bellator and fighting for the UFC? Um. Uh, man, I guess I could say bonuses, son. <laughs> yeah, that's the first time I, I I won one of those performances of night bonuses. But damn, Bellator needs to step up with that, you know, because that is life changing. That's like it's it's you know it, if they're intelligent with how they spend it, man. I mean, I, I'm I, I'm gonna invest it all back into you know my career, so. I'm looking. I'm looking to really, you know, do do the best I can and uh, see how how far I can really go in this uh, in this industry, you know. But um, I definitely think that if uh, Viacom or you know Coker, you know, make that decision, even if they start small, man, who cares? Ten thousand is a lot of money. So Jesus, just start with something and you know, get give it'll give the fighters a little more incentive. To, uh, to go out there and really and really put it all on the line, even though they are anyways, you know, for <laughs> for help for what we do for a living, mm. you know, it's it's nice. It, it it can definitely help motivation wise. Like, you know, I, I'm here training for Joe Riggs, and in my head, I'm like, oh damn, you know, like <laughs> this isn't just for my paycheck. This is for the possibility of a lot of money so you know <laughs> it's motivation to definitely fucking train my ass off and get you know get get uh get the work in proper wow yeah that, that's definitely a great point there now you know let's talk about your return to the ufc um tell us how did the ufc approach you to come back and what went through your mind when you realized you're officially going to come back with a company for a second run um I mean, I've been talking ever since I was with Bellator. I was still talking with Joe Silva. You know, we were joking back and forth, texting back and forth. He would wish me luck and congratulate me in fights and whatnot. Um, and and the plan always was to come back. Uh, when I finally got out of contract with Bellator, I had a stint with uh, with um, Titan FC, mm -hmm. and uh, I I I kept having like you know the. the it's just the fight game, man, and they're, you know, obviously they're not a UFC level show, so you know, I think they had some issues with main events falling out, and so shows kind of got pushed or moved or canceled, and so like I had quite a few fights and fight dates kind of rearranged and 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 moved back and postponed on numerous occasions, and it was really messing with the training camp. It was messing with financial funds invested in fights that weren't occurring. And uh, finally, I was supposed to fight for the welterweight title against Matt Riddle mm. um, for, for them. And uh, about three weeks before, um, Matt Riddle uh, did something to his ankle or something, had to pull out of the fight, and uh, they couldn't get anybody to, um, no one wanted to take the fight with me on, uh, on short notice. And, um, which, I mean, man, that's a, that's a tough fight. Three weeks notice, uh, to fight anyone can be, uh, can be, it can be a tough task, but, you know, to do it and, and, and be a main event is, uh, is probably asking a lot of some people, but nonetheless, they couldn't, they couldn't find anybody that, you know, wanted to jump in. Um, I thought I was going to be stuck without a fight and then, uh, Someone got injured at the UFC, um, and I hit up Joe Silva, and I'll let you know. You know, if you guys need, I, I hear you guys need a late replacement, and he was like, you know, go beat Riddle first, and uh, and we'll talk. And um, and I was like, well, Riddle's out, you know, uh, 
and they're trying to find me a replacement, but it's not looking good. And he was like, that sucks. And I'm like, yeah, it does. And then it was like nothing. <laughs> and then the next, <laughs> and then the, and then the next morning, I wake up and there's a a text from Bill Silver, and he's like, "Well, are you in contract with anybody?" And then I was like, "Well, I am in contract with Titan, but they do have a USC out clause. Though I know the out clause isn't like their out clause if you're if you're signed to fight." has to be within 30 days or something like that or or you can't just obviously pack up and leave and say oh no i got a better show peace you know Mm -hmm. and it makes sense but uh since no one was taking the the spot it was kind of like well you know i'm going to be stuck here without a fight anyways and uh we were able to get it arranged and tighten let me out and they understood and it was you know it was kind of a crappy situation for all for everyone involved as far as the titan situation (laughs) You know, they, they stepped up and, and they let me out of my contract. And then, uh, yeah, I was able to sign a, sign a deal with, uh, with Joe Silva, get back in the UFC. And, um, hell, man, I was just going in there. I was just going in there to try to prove, you know, they didn't make a wrong decision. I think I'm like, there maybe is one other person that the UFC has ever brought back on a loss. I don't even know who it is. <laughs> I don't even know what the circumstances were. But uh, basically, you know, they needed they they moved Jordan Maine up to fight uh, in the Coleman event, and they needed another spot on on the card, so they brought me in, mm. and uh, it went very well, man. I uh, I can't uh, I can't I can't think of a better a better ending. No, absolutely. First on platter in UFC history is absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, fi- I was going to say fighters often play out scenarios that may happen in the octagon, you know, in their head before they fight. You know, you talked about bonuses, uh, you know, giving you that motivation. Did you ever see yourself winning via the omoplata going into that fight with Chris? Um, I've been there before. I'm a fan of it. Um, you know, it, it's just, it is a hard one. You have to be very patient with it and you have to know what you're doing and feel comfortable in the situation and everything. Um, I, I, you know, any people can look at, um, another example would be when I fought, uh, Luis Sapo Santos in Bellator. I almost had to do him a plot in that one. He was able to roll out, but I was pretty much in the exact same position. Mm-hmm. I, just, I got a little, uh, a little over anxious and I, I stopped flattening him out and he was able to kind of tripod up and eventually roll. Um, but I was even doing, you know, from the wrist, trying to crank it over. Um, I, the second I got there and I had my hand around his waist and I felt how tight it was and I grabbed my shin, I was like, yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> sure this is going very well. <laughs> and, 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 and people ask me, <laughs> People ask me whether or not, you know, uh, I was, like, bunning for the Uma Plata. And I try to explain to them with jiu-jitsu, um, y- your best bet is, is to kind of kind of realize that there's different paths. Mm. Like, and you should know your style. And if, if you're good at jiu-jitsu, you know the different paths that or um, options that are available. And you can either force them or you can just to adapt to your – partner or opponent mm. and go whatever direction and whatever uh energy they're kind of feeding and that's kind of what happened with Duma Plata is I was there and I was kind of like well what what are you going to give me if you're going to give me this arm I'm going to take this arm if I'm elbowing you with this arm and you turn that way and you give me that arm then I'm going to take that so it wasn't like I'm here and I know 100% I'm going to go for the Plata it was kind of like I'm here I'm in control you choose your path and then I'll take advantage by knowing, Oh, once you chose that path, I know, okay, I'm really grabbing the hip. I'm really trying to flatten you out and so on. And, uh, and that's pretty much, you know, I, I drilled it a lot. I drilled it a lot. <laughs> I, I pretty much dreamt it. I, you know, I just, <laughs> we played everything over and over. I'm in my, my hotel room, just going over the movements in my head and kind of like pretending I'm, Submitting in a invisible body and stuff, and I'm just did anybody doing it walk so in much on that, that, What's that? Did, did anybody walk in in the hotel room when you're like practicing it on a plot on an invisible opponent? <laughs> well, they, they probably knocked, and I was like, "Oh yeah, no problem, guys. <laughs> nothing, nothing going on in here." <laughs>
Let's get back to this Joe Riggs fight, uh, Ben. You mentioned how much of a veteran this guy is. And funnily enough, you know, you guys have a similar story of both being in the UFC, going to Bellator and coming back. Um, you, you spoke about how tricky he can be. Just uh, if you can, tell us, what do you think some of the challenges will be when fighting Riggs um, in, in the octagon in December? Oh, man, I mean, he definitely has more experience than me, you know. Uh, I I think we're we're both mentally you know, uh, confident in our, in our skills and the fact that we're veterans that that's going to kind of play, um, on an even field, I believe, you know, he, he's definitely got heavy hands. He's definitely got good wrestling, um, pretty good, uh, submissions too. So, you know, I know he's going to be dangerous. I know he's going to be game. Uh, you know, I just, you know, I, I give him respect once the door closes. You know, uh, we fight with respect, but we also fight, you know, to finish. So, you know, hopefully it's it's going to be, a you know, uh, a brawl for the fans and, uh, you know, uh, exciting. And, and, and if we can uh, both win a, a damn bonus, great. If not, uh, <laughs> I, wanna, I would love to get a performance of the night uh, somehow. And we're going to talk to you in a second about what those could possibly be. But I want to touch on something. You know, Joe obviously had that injury. He obviously, you know, a gun went off. I think it was a shotgun went off. I mean, he had massive injuries to his hand, to his leg. And now he's going to fight you. It seems like a pretty quick turnaround. You know, I just wonder if we could get your thoughts on that as well. Um. Yeah, it was, it was, I don't know what kind of pistol, but it was a pistol. Um, I honestly didn't know too much about it, but obviously finding out I'm going to fight the man, I, you know, my friends knew what happened or read about it. And, um, I guess it was something like he, he had his pistol at the Academy and one of his teammates like sucked it back. I think the bullet got stuck and, and, uh, and kept it in like a, a cocked, uh, position and then I think when he got home, he tried to fix it, and uh, he wasn't paying attention to me. He was trying to find the USC contract, and then I guess he hit something, and it ended up, like, moving the bullet that was lodged in there. Wow. And then that kind of shot through his hand and then his leg or something like that. Yeah. So I don't, <laughs> I don't really know what to think about the situation. I've never been shot. Um... You know, I have shot guns. I uh, I have seen what guns can do to people, and uh, it sounds like a very traumatizing experience for him and his family. Mm. Um, I I I think he's okay. He sounds like he's okay. He says, you know, the doctors and everybody said, you know, he had a crazy fast recovery. Mm. Um. And it would make a little sense if you're in fight shape because he was supposed to fight pretty soon, and then that's when and he was signing the contract. So he was probably was supposed to fight within a month. Yeah. And uh, you know, hopefully that just allowed like his uh, his body to kind of be in um, a strong mode to to recover, and um, maybe that's that's how. Uh, like I said, I. I I don't know the, you know, obviously the extent of the injuries firsthand, so I don't know. But uh, if he says that he's good, I I hope I hope he is, and I hope he stays injury free, so we can uh, we can get this fight on, you know. Absolutely, yeah. and Riggs is an absolute warrior for that, and it's going to be a very exciting fight. Now, Ben, we do a thing here on Submission Radio called Tap Out Round. It's basically a round where we throw a whole bunch of fun questions at you, and you answer with the first thing that comes to mind. So when you're ready, we're going to kick it off. Okay, <laughs> I'll give it a shot. <laughs> okay, awesome. Now, look, we've just been talking about some of the amazing things that you can do in this fight to win a performance bonus so we got the marketing team together and we came up with three amazing finishes that we think that you could you could possibly do as scenarios in your next fight against Riggs. we'd like you to choose the one that you think is most likely to happen okay ben all right okay the first one is and this one you know a pretty simple one a flying reverse triangle choke 
Number two. Okay. Number two is a knockout by a stern look across the cage. <laughs> or number three, catching Joe Riggs in a go-go plata while he's still standing a second after you touch gloves. Which one is most likely to happen, Ben? Go-go <laughs> mm. <Double> plata. <laughs> is it two seconds, five seconds? How many seconds after touching gloves? Oh, well, oh, we, we said half a second, but it, look, essentially, that's up to you how quickly you can lock it in. Okay, so the third basically just jump for it the second we tap. Exactly. I'll go with that one. I'll go with that one. I think that's the most, out of on those three, that's the most possible. <laughs> there you go. Ben Saunders is going to be breaking <laughs> a, a shitload of records come December 13th. Now, uh, <laughs> we want to get a grappling prediction from you, Ben. You know, who's winning between Sakuraba and Henzo at Metamoris? I say Henzo. Right. For sure. Um, I don't know if there's going to be a big size difference between them, but not only am I – I mean, I love them both. I'm a huge fan of both. I'm mm. a huge fan of, like, the, just the legendary status of the fact that that's even happening. is pretty crazy. Yeah. But um, I think, I think Takaraba has been in some horrific fights towards yeah. the end of his career that may have really messed him up. Um, and Henzo I've seen personally <laughs> uh, recently, and he's looking really healthy. You know, I, mm. I think I think he's been in, in, enjoying some uh, some food a little bit, but nonetheless, like <laughs> injury wise, the man the man looks like he's still as much of a beast as ever. So I don't know if there's going to be a size difference, but uh, I think I, I give it to Henzo. Now, Ben. Fans know you for smiling while you fight. We're just wondering, what's the strangest place you've ever been caught smiling? Oh, man, my... I would probably say a few funerals. A few funerals? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, like one of, one of them was my, my best friend's grandfather's funeral, but we were like... 12 years old, 13 years old, so we were retarded. <laughs> and uh, the other one was in high school for my best friend's mom. I don't know, man. We just, <laughs> smiling tends to creep out in awkward, horrible situations for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's the only way to go. You just got to whip out a smile. Now, Ben, yeah, we know yeah. that you can put on a great alma plata, but what's your signature dish when you're in the kitchen? Uh man, I'd say either pasta uh, or eggs. <laughs> eggs are good. Nice, nice. Now Ben, you, you mentioned that I was gonna say I was I was gonna say you know chicken and rice and stuff, but realistically, I'd say I'd probably cook eggs more. <laughs> He's an all rounder. Now Ben, you mentioned how much you love winning performance of the night bonuses. What did you spend your performance of the night bonus on last? Uh well this is the first one I ever got. What did you spend it what did you spend it on, Ben? Uh have yet to spend it. <laughs> have yet to spend <laughs> it. I'm I'm just uh just trying to make sure my uh you know, my, my taxes and my bills are right and then and, and and like I said, invest it back into my, my career, you know. Um I'm, I'm gonna go uh I'm gonna end up going to LA and working with Eddie Bravo. And uh, nice. tighten on my rubber guard, working down south, uh, ATT headquarters, and um, you know, just trying to uh, trying to get as good as I can, man. Trying to, if possible, who knows? We'll see what happens after this fight, and then uh, we'll see what 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 they might have planned next if I if I come out, uh, you know, with a good uh, good victory. Now, Ben, you know, you're an interesting character. Finish this sentence for us. People don't know that I... Uh, play with my dog and talk to him like he's a human being or an alien. <laughs> we're, all, we're all guilty of that, Ben. Don't worry about that. <laughs> now, now they know. Now, uh, Ben, I read an interesting story, and correct me if this is wrong, but you told your parents that you were going to college when you went to train, and um, just let, let us know, what was your parents' reaction when they found out that Ben doesn't actually have a degree from college, but he, you know, he's obviously a professional fighter. Um, well, what made it worse is I wasn't a professional fighter by the time they found out. <laughs> I was just, 
I was just training to be a professional <laughs> a professional fighter. So it was basically, yeah, I'm not getting paid to do this. I'm actually losing money driving and coming here to do this. But you got to understand, in due time, there's potential that there might be a dollar or two in it for me. <laughs> Um, they kind of dealt with it, but then when my car broke down, I lost my job because of that. And then I was getting evicted. That's when my whole family kind of came at me. Like, what are you doing with your life? What are you crazy? What is this fighting stuff? You're not even making any money from it. What are you thinking? Blah, blah, blah. And then that's when it was bad, man. I kind of had to, uh, kind of blacklist my family for a while. I'm like, well, you guys are going to support me. You know, I'm not going to sit here and get bashed for it. So I was kind of like, you know, peace out. And uh, it really wasn't until I made it on the show um, that I was like, huh, huh, see, I was able to go up to Christmas, uh, up to Connecticut with my family and be like, yeah, see, I'm not a loser. I'm not like this. I told you there's something there. <laughs> and they ended up, uh, finally turning around and now they're all kind of, you know, uh, very, very happy for me. And finally, still, ben- still my mom, still my mom gets scared. Obviously they, you know, quite a few of them, family members get scared. It's a fight. You know, uh, other than my brother Jacob, everyone else is kind of more of the passive side. So <laughs> that's the only uh, the downfall. Yeah, mom's got like that. <laughs> Sorry. Finally, Ben, how are you planning to beat Joe Riggs at UFC on Fox? Oh, man, that's a good question. Uh, I got a good answer. It might not be what you're looking for, but my answer is by any means necessary, sir. Hey, that's that, whatever gets the job done. I will certainly be watching. Uh, Guys, it's going to be December 13th. Deep Kundo, man. Deep Kundo. We come at him like Bruce Lee. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you can watch Ben Saunders using his Jeet Kune Do on December 13th in the, in America, or, of course, if you're in Australia in the future, uh, December 14th. Uh, don't forget to follow Ben Saunders on Twitter at Ben Saunders MMA. Ben, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. No, thank you guys, man. I'm really happy to uh, to be here. <laughs> it was an awesome time. Um, just to let uh, anybody know, if you guys want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, my name is at Ben Saunders MMA. For Facebook, it's facebook.com slash I am Ben Saunders. And I've been filming a documentary that actually started in my time with Bellator, um, as well as going into my Titan FC situation leading into my last fight in the UFC getting the Uma plot to finish and uh, we uh, we got a trailer up and a, uh, a sponsor package PDF that people can download uh, just go to bensaundersdocumentary.com and check it out uh, we're looking forward to uh, getting this finished pretty quickly I think it will be uh, something very interesting and hopefully inspiring for you know, fighters or just people in general to watch uh, kind of the ups and downs of the sport. And um, it should be really cool. And does this masterpiece have a title at the moment, Ben? Um, right now it's called, uh, oh, man, what is it? Inside the Fight? Inside or, the fight. I, right. I forget. I, 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 for, I forget what they, they, they called it. Uh, CSM Studios, they're the, uh, the production company that they're, uh, putting it together right now. Um, but if you definitely go to the website, you'll be able to see the trailer. It's a badass trailer. And uh, I'm, I'm definitely hoping that uh, we can get this done leading into this fight. Awesome. Well, we'll certainly try and put a link up so that the fans can check it out. Uh, definitely check that out, guys. And again, Ben, thank you so much for coming on the show. No, thank you guys for having me. It was an honor. And uh, I'm sure we'll do it again real soon. Hey, this is Alistair Overeem, and you are listening to Submission Radio. Our next guest is a UFC veteran. He is known all around the world for his exciting fighting style, and he has now become a coach at Team Alpha Male. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our pleasure to welcome back to the show Martin Campman. Martin, welcome to Submission Radio. What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. 
It's great to have you back on the show, Martin. You know, we've been keeping in touch with you uh, for a while now, and you've been traveling all over the world. You know, tell us, how was your trip, and uh, what, are some, what are some of the things that happened while you are traveling? Uh, yeah, I went to Denmark for uh, two months, and then I'll, while I was over there, I, I, I uh, did some uh, little, little uh, Europe, European tour, you might say, and uh, went out a bunch of gyms and uh, did some training seminars and got to see a bunch of stuff, so that was pretty cool. That's, whereabouts in Europe did you go to? Uh, I went to Sweden, Norway, Scotland, and Italy, and then I'll Very to Denmark. Nice. Very nice, very nice. Uh, ne- take us to Denmark with you next time. That sounds like a fun trip. Now, um, it looks yeah. like you've it, it looks like you've officially become a part of Team Alpha Male as a coach. Uh, tell us, what's it like moving to Sacramento, and how's the family liking the move? We like it. You know, I just, I just, uh, it's still pretty new. You know, we moved out here, and I uh, just, you know, just like within the last couple of, of uh, weeks, we've gotten all our stuff out here, and uh, you know. Uh, and uh, been, uh, taking a big, big truck out from Vegas, so so it's still pretty new, but we like it. We gotta, uh, you know, still getting to know the city, getting to know the the gym and all that stuff. But uh, so far, I, I really enjoy it, you know. Now, Martin, Team Alpha Male has a very deep, talented roster of fighters. You know, now that you're a coach, what are some of the things you plan on working with the guys on? Um, I, I have a, lo- a lot of stuff, you know. I, it's it's mostly uh, you know smaller stuff. Obviously, you guys have a ton of great great guys, but I think it's the uh, it's the little guys, you know. Everybody, every, 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 it's little things, you know. Everybody still makes mistakes, you know. Everybody, everybody makes mistakes, so picking up on those mistakes and and and, and uh, you know, correcting those and, and t- taking all those weaknesses out of your game is, is a big part, you know. Because every time you have a little weakness, that's that's uh, you know possibility for your opponent to exploit that. So I'm trying to be the, do the best to be the coach that that uh, I would have always wanted to have for myself, you know. And uh, that's that's my whole whole. Uh, way of, of looking at it, you know, and um, I'm, I'm really focused on MMA as a whole, not just, you know, one part of the game, but I'm trying to really make, you know, when I'm doing grappling, it's well regards to MMA and same thing for striking or wrestling, I'm trying to keep everything uh, minded for MMA competition. And, you know, speaking of obviously training and, you know, being the coach that you've always wanted, when you were on the show last, you spoke about, you know, some of the stories from training. You know, you obviously used to train with guys like Vitor, Forrest, you know, Vandalay, and you saw some people get, you know, knocked out in training and dangerous things like that. How do you approach, you know, things like sparring when you're, when you're in Team Alpha Male? You know, does it go full out or is it, you know, a little bit different now? Uh, the sparring here is... People still spar pretty hard here at Alpha Male. I, I'd say that, but uh, you know they only spar once a week. I think that's that's at least uh, that's a good thing. You know, don't don't, don't be going, uh, don't be you know. Back in Victoria, we used to spar hard twice a week. I think that's too much. Mm. Here it's, it's once a week <laughs> sparring, and uh, I mean this past uh, sparring, I I've, I've actually had it. Uh, we had it all, everybody go you know small glove sparring, and then you know trying to keep it more technical and less. Uh, when people got this big gloves on sometimes people try to swing for the fences and stuff like that so i think it's a uh, you know mixing it up i don't think you have to do uh i think minimizing your hard sparring is, is definitely a smart way to go if you want to have long longevity in your career now martin we heard that you know, dwayne ludwig is still training with a lot of the guys are uh, coming back and forth we're just wondering you know now that you're a coach over at team alpha alpha what kind of dynamic do you have with dwayne when it comes to training fighters such as chad mendes and tj dillashaw um, I, I, I actually haven't seen him at all since I uh, came out here, but, um, obviously, you know, he, Chad was already in the middle of his training camp, so I think he's already set up for that, and, um, I'm not really sure what the, what the plan is, uh, going forward, but, you know, obviously, TJ has really enjoyed working with Dang, and Dang's done a great job helping him improve on the striking and stuff like that, but, uh, I'm just gonna, you know, do my best coaching, and, and um, so far I've had really positive feedback. And uh, you know, however that's going to work out, is, I don't, I don't really know. To be honest with you. Now, obviously, as a full-time trainer, is it still likely that we'll see you return to the octagon again, or are you officially retired from fighting, Martin? Ah, uh, you know, never say never, but I, I can't see myself fighting anytime soon. Well, you know, that's sure. that's pretty. 
That, that's pretty disappointing because you're definitely one of our favorites. And, you know, speaking of your division, the welterweight division, it's really heating up with, you know, Robbie Law and Johnny Hon Hendricks having a rematch. Um, you know, you've been in the cage with Hendricks before. What are your thoughts on this fight? Do you think he walks out uh, the champion in this one? You know what? I I, I, uh, I know it's uh, I missed out, but I still haven't watched the first fight. And I heard it was a great fight. So I think I would have, I have a lot better uh, way to assess it if I've seen the first fight. So uh, I don't. Uh, I gotta watch it. I want to watch the first one before I watch the second one. Now, obviously, another big fight coming up is the title fight between Chad Mendes and Jose Aldo. You know, Chad was on the show to discuss some of the difficulties that he faced last time when fighting in Brazil. You know, is uh, having the rematch there something that's a concern for the team at all? Is, is having a rematch a concern? No, not not the rematch, but the fact that the rematch is in Brazil. Yeah, I mean, it's. I'm sure, uh, you know, I'm sure Chad would have preferred to fight here in the U.S. But you know, when Aldo is the champ and you're coming in as, as a contender, you can't really, uh, you know, make demands like that. So that's something you can do when once he becomes the champ. But uh, uh, I don't. I'm not. You know. You know, fighting overseas is always different. You know, you don't know what kind of food is there in, in regards to cutting cut weight and stuff like that. And you also have to deal with time difference and stuff. But um, you know, I'm sure he'll uh, manage and um, he'll come well prepared. He's, he's looking uh, looking very good in training, looking sharp. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing him kick some ass for sure. Now, you know, Martin, you've, you've mentioned how much you, you know, you're enjoying working at Team Alpha Male. Uh, you know, tell some of the listeners, who are some of the fighters that you enjoy working with, you know, that may not be huge stars just yet? Who are some of the names in t t t uh, Team Alpha Male that really uh, excite you for the future? Uh, I think, uh, like, a guy like uh, Lance Palmer is, is very good. You know, he's got a ton of talent. He's got a, a really good, strong wrestling background. And, you know, he's a little serious of fighting right now. But, um, I, I, that's a guy I'd love to see fighting in UFC as well, and um, obviously I think he's going to do great things in the in the World Series fighting. But he's he's really really good. There's a lot of other other tough guys coming up, and I'm sure you're going to hear more about him. Well, speaking of guys coming up, I mean, you know, TJ Dillashaw, it seems like, obviously he's been good for a long time, but it seems like overnight he's gone from huge underdog to, you know, basically the champion of the bantamweight division in the UFC, and it uh, looks like he'll be fighting Dominic Cruz, uh, you know, very soon. Yeah, have you have you guys thought about that fight? Have you talked about that fight at all with TJ? Uh, I think it's still going to be a while, you know, because TJ's out with injury right now, so uh, I don't know what the date the frame is it, but you know TJ's not not in, back in training yet, uh, so I'm sure it's gonna, gonna be a while before they can line it up. But um, obviously, it's a fight that I really look forward to. Dominic Cruz is a very good fighter, and uh, you know he's very elusive with his footwork and angles and stuff like that. I think it could be a great fight. In, ter but, um, in, in terms of the style, you know, just sort of technically, have you have you had a chance to analyze Dominic's style much, or not just yet because the fight's you know not yet official. No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, um, I have other guys I'm focused on, I, and uh, I don't think that fight is is even scheduled. Or I mean, it's all talk right now. Yeah. And and, and TJ's not TJ's not in training right now. He's he's a uh, he's a, he's injured injured. Now you know, Martin, you, you're obviously a veteran of the sport, and you've you've been through a lot of gyms. You've you've been in a lot of places. Like you mentioned, you've trained all over the world. You know what what's Team Alpha Male like uh, for you to be at? Obviously, it's a lot different from Extreme Couture, like you mentioned. Tell us what kind of vibe does the gym have, and you know what are some of the things that you enjoy uh, about working at Team Alpha Male? I think there's a great atmosphere at the gym. There's a great uh, camaraderie. And, uh, you know, they've really done a great job, you know, um, also creating stuff outside the, outside the gym, you know, like guys meeting up for barbecues or going to the river for, uh, you know, jet skiing or, or, or wakeboarding and stuff like that. And that really creates a great camaraderie and everybody's, uh, you know, looking out for Joe's best interest and, and, and want to, want to see each other succeed, you know. And another thing I always noticed even before I got to see Nelson Mail is that, when uh, they have somebody fighting, they always come out strong. You know, the whole team usually comes out and support when they have somebody fighting. I think that's, uh, you know, creates a great team sphere as well. Absolutely, man. And, you know, you mentioned that you went around the world. You went to a whole bunch of uh, countries in Europe and you did your seminars. You know, what's some of the people can expect from typical Martin camp and seminar? And what's probably one of the most important things that you teach in one of your seminars? 
I think one uh, thing I really, you know, emphasize a lot is, is, uh, is uh, I try to keep everything minded for MMA, you know, because you can you can show a lot of jiu-jitsu moves, wrestling moves, even, even striking moves, you know, that, that works good in each particular aspect of, uh, you know, it works for jiu-jitsu, it works for wrestling, but when you take it to MMA, it's not that practical, it's not that applicable, and mm-hmm. I, I try to really make everything applicable towards MMA, you know, if, if MMA is, is your... It's the, what you're going to compete in. I think you should cater your training towards MMA, and, and that's going to make you have the, the fastest learning curve. And, uh, and you know, when I started learning my wrestling, I tried all my wrestling has been, been, been minded towards MMA, and, and uh, I've managed to take some guys down and, and defend take down some guys on paper. They were, you know, on paper, they're better wrestlers from any background, but, but I've still been able to out-wrestle them. And uh, I think, you know, dressing for MMA is definitely different, and, and that goes for for everything. You know, and uh, I also have some from um, affiliate gyms that I work with, and uh, that's one of the things that I that I uh, really emphasize in, in the in the program that I that I teach. You know, Juan, and it's no secret that you know you're a, you're a big star in MMA. But what people may not know about you is you're actually a very very good poker player. Now, uh, last time we spoke, you know, you spoke a little bit about your poker. Tell us what's been going on. In the world of Martin Campman and poker, what are some of the updates? What have you been up to in that world? Uh, nothing, nothing big uh, lately. Unfortunately, I wish I could report some big winnings, but <laughs> I played a, a few tournaments here and there. But you know, back when I was, I was in, in Europe for two two months, and I didn't really have time to play at all. Um, but I played one bigger tournament here in, in uh, Sacramento, where I made it to day two uh, and um, of the tournament. But then I busted out, you know pretty close to the to the bubble. The bubble's where the money starts coming. So that was, you know, unfortunate. And um I can't remember when was the last time we talked. I played World I played World Series of Coke were also the the main event. That was a that was a you know pretty awesome experience to play that. It was a ten million dollar first prize. So obviously there's so many people and there's like almost seven thousand people in it. But still it was wow. it was fun to play it. I, I also made it um Past the day one, but then I, I busted out. I didn't cash. But um, actually next next week I'm, I'm I'll, I'll probably I'll, I gotta defend. I think it's, it's starting. It's coming up. It's here. In, it's, it's gonna be in Reno. The the, the tournament I won in Reno here this spring. I, I gotta go defend my title out there, and hopefully, hopefully uh, that's where I won a, a bigger tournament out there. So I gotta go defend my title out there for coming up very soon, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. Neman, we don't know. Hopefully, 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 next time we talk, I can uh, report some winnings, not just losses. <laughs> hopefully, by next time you have like a mansion, own a tiger, like fifty cars and stuff like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If, you, if you win this ten, if you win this, if you win this ten million dollar prize, don't worry, you can fly us in, you know, to Sacramento. We'll do the interview live with you. It's, it's not a problem. Yeah. Our, our schedules are free. <laughs> well, that that turn that turn was already over. That was this summer. That that was right before I went to Denmark. Actually, that was that was right before I took off to Denmark. So, uh, unfortunately, no ten ten million dollars this time. Well, you Maybe know, next year. In terms of poker, I mean, we don't know much about it, but to our knowledge, you know, as far as card games go, it's the one we have the most sort of control over, the best chances of winning, and most of it's not about the cards, it's about, you know, expression on your face and, and things like that, the mental games. Do you ever get people, like, where you're playing against them and they're sort of distracted, like, fuck, I'm playing against Martin Campman, you know, UFC fighter. Do you ever get anything like that? Uh man, I, I wish I could say yes, but I don't think so. I don't, unfortunately, I don't think my, uh, my my uh, my fighting skills uh, helped me too much, you know. I I could try to intimidate them, you know, but <laughs> you know, I, I think I'd get in trouble if I start punching people at the poker table. <laughs> and you know, an- another guy from the um, UFC who's pretty good at poker is Bruce Buffer. Have you had a chance to play against Bruce? And you know, let's let's do a prediction here: you versus Bruce in a poker in a poker tournament. Who do you think wins if you guys are in the final? Oh, obviously, I'm, I'm I I got to take myself up there you know what i can't go i can't bet against myself i'm i'm uh, <laughs> i got i got confidence i got confidence but uh i never played against bruce before but uh, i know he plays a lot i saw him at that world series poker and we played the same event but uh we were never at the same table very nice 
Now, Martin, we've got a few fan questions. We'll let them know. And obviously, the fans uh, wrote in, put some questions in. Uh, first one is from Philip Rasmussen. I hope I pronounced that right. At DK underscore sport 92. Uh, he wanted to ask you, do you see more Danish fighters coming to the UFC? I hope so. I hope so. There's, uh, there's a couple of guys that's uh, really tough. You know, uh, um, Mikko Parlo, he's signed with Bellator right now. He's, he's, he's good. And, and uh, you know, train, train a lot with him as well. I think he could do well. Uh, another up and coming guy in, uh, in uh, actually my weight division is um, uh, Dalby. And, uh, you know, if he, he gets some more wins, I think he could, he could also make uh, the transition. And, uh, you know, obviously, I'd, I'd love to see uh, more guys uh, get over there and, and, and fight in the UFC. And uh, see that Denmark being a uh, better represented. So far, I'm the only guy, you know. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's that's actually very impressive, though, Martin. Now we've got another question here uh, from a man whose username is Lost. He'd like to know what do you think are the biggest cultural differences between the United States and Denmark? Man, yeah, there's a lot of cultural differences. It's it's hard hard to pinpoint the biggest, and you no, know, I don't know, like. Uh, I don't know. Like, there's a lot of things. One thing, you know, in the U.S., you know, people, people want to come over, get autographs and you know, pictures and stuff like that. In Denmark, it's more. There's less of a, of a, what you call, like idolization of, you know, people. You know, they don't. You know, of course, sometimes I'll have people that want to come take a picture, but people don't go and ask you for autographs and stuff like that. You know, it's just not. It's just not. Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of other smaller things. Generally, you know, a lot of people in, in, in Denmark are, are, are being raised just to be very modest and you not know, supposed to, you know, kind of uh, stand out too much. So at least if you do well, you, you, you're, you're, you're raised to be more modest about it. Where in the U.S., people are, there's more sometimes, you know, if you do well, people are like, look at me, I'm, I'm the man, I want to blow himself up, you know, but that says a lot of cultural differences. I think that makes sense. You know, Dennis obviously being Ukrainian, myself being Polish, we can completely understand that. Um, another fan question, Peter Parker 66, uh, he wanted to know, and this is a big hypothetical, if you do decide to come back, who would you like to fight for your fight, uh, for your comeback fight? Man, I'm, I haven't, uh, I don't even know. I haven't thought about it. Somebody uh, maybe in a weight class, three, you know, below me and, Missing an arm or leg, like an easy, easy tune-up fight. <laughs> yeah, you sound, you sound like, like me a, and Casper. Yeah, like a com- very, like a complete walkover. That'd be awesome, you know. <laughs> Just go to like the payday and get, get used to the, you know, walking out again and all that stuff. You know, that'd be awesome. You know, they always give me tough ass fights. I've never gotten any easy fights in UFC. It's I'm a bit of, you know, all top, top ten guys or title contender guys, you know, I've, I've had a bunch of tough fights. It'd be nice to get a, a easy walk over for once, right? Yeah. Now, you, you've absolutely fought a murderer's row in the UFC. Well, here's a question. Do you do you still fight but playing the EA UFC video game? Or do you play as yourself at all? No, man. I wish I had time to play video games. I got I got two kids. I don't, I don't have time to play video games. If I'm taking time to play any games, I'm playing, playing the poker instead. Yeah. Now, Martin, as you know, when you come on Submission Radio, there's always a tap-out round at the end where we throw a bunch of fun questions at you and you answer with the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, here we go. Now, Martin, you've traveled a lot. Tell us, what's your favorite country to visit and why? I'll say Australia. (laughs) Ah, the right answer. That's a good Good, one, huh? That's a good one, right? (laughs) It was a trick question. There was only one answer and you got it. Very good, Martin. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Martin, you mentioned your kids before. What's one show you can't stand that you have to constantly watch because your kids love it? Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't mind the shows too much. You know, there's the Mickey Mouse clubs, but I think it's, it's all right. There's a little education, educational stuff in there too. You know, they got to learn what a triangle is and learn to count and something like that. That's Not true. too bad. Well, I you like really SpongeBob become... too, but SpongeBob, SpongeBob, there are no educational stuff in it. It's just more fun, though. Yeah. That's... That's right. Adventure Time's pretty good as well. Now, you know, we were talking about poker before. Um, have you had a chance to play it with the guys at Team Alpha Male? And who has the best poker face, you think, out of all of the guys there? Uh, no, I haven't had a chance. I haven't had a chance to play any of the, any poker with the guys at Team Alpha Male. But uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll have the opportunity. 
All right, now are you Martin? Are you an official Sacramento Kings supporter now? See, uh, you don't. You can't ask me any sports question. I don't even know what, what sport we're talking here. <laughs> Basketball. I don't, I don't, but, I don't, okay. I'm European. I, I know. See, I, you know, I'm. All I know is I watch. I, I watch. Uh, you know, soccer, European. You know, the World Cup. I watch World Cup and European Cup maybe, but I don't know anything about football or. Or uh, baseball or, or anything. So, yeah, I'm a there's, poor man. Who that poor guy there's, a Sacramento, there's, there's a Sacramento King listening to this interview right now who has a tear in his eye. So, I hope you're happy about that, Martin. Yeah, now. They're going to be very really disappointed. I'm going to have to yeah. follow up. They play, NBA, they play NBA or what? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. As a matter of fact, yeah. I think there was, they did this one promotion where they had the, the top five and they had the guys from Team Alpha Male. So, but they're not the best team, so it's okay that you don't support them. Now, um, Martin, your friend Randy Couture recently finished doing his Dancing with the Stars gig. Uh, we're, we're just wondering, what would you give the Naturals dance moves out of 10? Um, you know, I think uh, I'll give him a... I'll give him a 10 for effort. <laughs> 10 for effort. I agree. I'm going to give him 9.5 just because not enough takedowns, man. Really needed more takedowns. <laughs> yeah. Now, Martin, what's happening with Robert Drysdale? Do you know? Will we see him back in uh, MMA again soon? You know what? I haven't talk, talked to Robert since I moved out here to Sacramento, but uh, uh, I'll definitely uh, I got to hit him up sometime. I know how he's doing, but uh, I don't. I don't know. Now, this question is a little bit similar to the one we asked you previously during the interview, but this, this one's a bit more fun. If you could fight at any weight class, you could be a heavyweight, who knows, you could go pride on us and go super heavyweight against anybody in the history of MMA, and that could be in any weight class as well. Who, Which weight class would you be in and who would you choose? To fight? I don't know. I think one of my all-time all -time favorites in MMA fighters is uh, Sagaraba. Yeah. You know, I don't know if I, I, I'd want to fight him, though, you know, but... I just think he's a badass, and I love watching the fight. We absolutely love Sakuraba. Well, you know what? This We didn't have this question originally, but you know what? Uh, can you make a prediction for us? Sakuraba versus Henzo Gracie at Meta Morris. Who's going over? Who do you think wins that one? Um, I think Henzo should probably take it, you know, but, I mean, it's it's a, it's only a submission. That, you know, I don't know how much uh, Sakuraba, his crazy style, I think, is better for MMA than it is for straight up grappling but you know mm. I could be completely wrong I, I, I have no idea really if uh, I think maybe I don't know I don't know how much uh, I think maybe Henzo Gracie's been been training more than Sakuraba has I don't know Sakuraba just seems to kick back and chill and then when it's time to fight he just steps up and fights yeah. And finally, Martin, give us a little prediction. What's going to be a signature Catman move that we're going to start seeing the Team Alpha Male fighters use in the octagon from now on? Can you give us a little tip, a little a little preview of a, of a cool technique that they'll start using from now on? Man, I can't. That's, that's just got to be a secret, right? You can't, you can't, <laughs> you can't spoil the surprise. Well, all right. Well, he's he's an international man of mystery officially. He's Martin Campman. I guess we're going to have to watch every single Team Alpha Male fight now to see what patterns we see and what differences we see now that Martin Campman's in the house. Guys, don't forget to follow Martin on Twitter at Martin Campman, K A M P M A N N. Martin, it's always a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, guys. Anytime. This is Randy Couture, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Our next guest is a UFC legend who will be fighting Tito Ortiz at Bellator 131, November 15th. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the American psycho and MMA legend, Stefan Bonner, to the program. Stefan, it's actually an honor to have you on Submission Radio. Welcome. Oh, nonsense. By the end of the interview, you'll say it's a disgrace. <laughs> well, you know, um, let, let's, have a, let's have a chat about this. It's going to be, it's just over a month till you step back in the cage and uh, to fight Tito Ortiz. Before we speak about Tito, tell us how excited are you to get back in the cage and fight one more time? Well, I mean, these circumstances have, have me awfully excited. I got blessed to fight, you know, a big name, a really big name. I got blessed to be at main event. I got blessed that it's live and free on Spike TV. And I got blessed that it just happens to be the biggest douchebag the sport of MMA has ever known. So just I'm blessed in so many ways. 
Seems like it's Christmas for you already, Stefan. Now, um, your feud with Tito is huge, but before we get to that, you know, we were listening to an interview you did a while back where you discussed your passion for the world of trading. Are you still trading now? And for fans listening at home, tell us a bit about how you got into this industry. Oh, hell yeah. Um, I got into it, let's see, uh, yeah, like after I retired, a couple months after I retired, uh, I was also getting the knee surgery too. And then it was like, okay, I'm retired, I'm getting knee surgery. Um, yeah, I got to find out, figure out another way to make money. And I dabbled a little of the, the, the trading with, you know, when you just buy stocks and whatnot and buy stuff and, you know, like, oh, Apple pulls back, so you're going to buy some and hold on to it. Or, you know, I did that with some airline stocks and Netflix. But then I got into day trading, uh, the futures, the, uh, like, S&P 500 futures market, where you, you know, every day you just look for setups and uh, read the market in real time and, and make decisions. And, you know, a lot of trades you close out, like, half hour. And, and, you know, all of them by the end of the day, and it just it was different. And, I mean, it was really exciting. What a rush. I, I, I learned a lot of lessons. I broke a lot of rules and made a lot of money um, doing the wrong thing. It's a bit that I paid for it that bit me in the ass. And I got lucky that I did get my whole account liquidated. That caught, like, a couple big corrections of open position. And then you learn. So, but it's just something that, you know, you're tired from fighting, and I, I like, needed something. I'm kind of OCD, so... I needed something else to obsess on. And it was all, like, my whole life was all about UFC, whether it was fighting or training or teaching seminars or making event T-shirts or making goofy T-shirts for the fighters or doing TV work. I mean, it was like my whole life uh, was centered around the UFC. It was, like, my source of identity. And then, you know, that went, and it was like, shit, what am I left with, you know? Mm -hmm. um, just just some dipshit who only knows how to fight people in a cage. Learn something <laughs> else. Well, so that know, was screaming at me, and it was something I just loved. And, and, like, man, I've literally, let's say, I started about a year and a half ago, and since December, like, I've, I've probably logged in thousands of hours of studying. It was just like, my wife thought I was nuts. Like, are you kidding me? That's all you do. <laughs> so now I've been trained for this fight again, and... um that's another thing that Cheetah's going to have to pay for. It's going to cost me money, you know? I got I could watch the market open in the morning because I think I'm on the West Coast open at 6.30, but you know, within a couple hours, I got to close everything up and go to the gym and train. And, you know, I miss out on a lot of opportunities. And uh, this jerk Cheetah's costing me money right now. Now, you know, you meant you briefly mentioned your retirement from the UFC and, you know, we're going to get to the Tito fight in a moment. But I was just wondering, you mentioned you briefly mentioned how difficult it was for you to make that decision. Um, I'm just wondering um, if you could tell us, you know, what really went through your mind when you were making that decision? Because, you know, a lot of fighters that we speak to, they say on, on good days, they feel like they could get into that uh, octagon and fight the best. And on bad days, they realize that, you know, it might be time for retirement. What what sort of went into your decision from retiring from the UFC? Uh, probably like 10 surgeries, a dozen broken bones, and the fact <laughs> that the fighters keep getting younger and, and better, and you just keep getting older and more broken down. And really, I, I was only interested in like kind of big-name fights, right? I, I could go in and just, you know, uh, throw caution to the wind and put on a show. And uh, really, the you know, UFC and Dana, it's all about, you getting that title shot. So you put a nice winning streak together. We don't care if you want to fight for us and coach the show. We don't care if you want to maybe fight Rampage. You're fighting the next guy in line that's trying to get that title. And uh, it was kind of like, um, man, fuck this shit. You know, I've done it like 12 years. Uh, no, no thanks. Like, no thanks. Let me, like, uh, move on with my life. You know, because I was. I mean, it never gets easy. And, and, you know, like every fight, you got to go through hell to get yourself there. Like, you know, not even go through hell pushing yourself and sparring every day and getting kicked in the nuts on a regular basis, plus having to lose 30-plus pounds in two months. And um, it, it never gets easy. It's not like baseball where I could be 40 years old with a big belly and a chew of tobacco in and <laughs> freaking hit the wall and run 90 feet to first base and catch my breath. You know, this is a fight at the highest level. And, uh yeah, it was like if, if I wasn't going to get any of those things I asked for, um, and it was just going to be all about who's, who I got to fight next in line to get that title shot, 
I was like, no thanks. Like, uh, um, I've had enough of this shit. I'll move on. So it wasn't too hard. But then this opportunity too, Bellator called. You know, yeah. Well, actually, it was, it was uh, Cheeto's manager, Dave Thomas. She was looking for a good fight for Cheeto, someone with a name. You know, it looked like the Rampage fight wasn't going to happen. I don't know exactly. He's got some contract or something going on with Bellator. So, um, and they wanted to saw, you know, a big fight before the end of the year. And, you know, first, what do you think about fighting for Bellator? I was like, no, you know, I'm, you know, not burning any bridges with the UFC. And plus, like, what, they're going to throw me in the tournament and then yada, yada, no thanks. And then it was like, well, what if it was for a tight fight with Tito? And I said, fuck yeah, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So had it not been against Tito, you would have maybe never gone back to Bellador, maybe never gone back to fighting. Is that correct? No, definitely no. And I said, let me check with Dana first. And, you know, he was all for it. Like, man, hope you beat the shit out of him and make a lot of money. And it was like, all right, cool. He's cool with it. Like, it's a fight with Cheeto. It's, it's uh, against a big name. It's, uh, you know, on free TV, main event, plus... It's a guy I, I truly never cared for and and have nothing but utter disdain for. And I could go and let the world know what I feel, what I feel about him, what I think of him, and uh, then go in there and put on a show. And, and, yeah, just make it a crazy fight. And that's my game plan. Just go in there and and throw caution to the wind and, and put on a barn burner and get the fans cheering. That's really it. No pressure. Now, now you must have known or at least spoken and been around Tito quite a few times back in the UFC. I mean, I guess the question is, why the dislike with Tito now? Why not in the UFC? Is it something that Tito's done recently, or what exactly is your problem with it? Why the disdain? Not so much. We were always cordial with each other. And then, you know, like, usually after you fight a guy, especially a couple times, and, you know, you do PR interviews together, you kind of like, get along, like, like me and Forrest, and they become pretty good friends. And, uh... You know, even from Forrest, but with Gito, like, he tried to like him. It just wasn't happening. And, and I knew a lot of, uh, you know, Gito's old buddies and training partner, team punishment guys. Like, the guys that, you know, spend time with him in the Bay Area, guys like Justin McCulley, other guys that I want to mention. And even before the fight, it's like, hey, what's going on? Gito, you tired? Is he going to fight again? And everyone says the same thing. Do they, do they look at me kind of the corner of the side with a sour look on their face? Like, are they just say someone sour? And they say, man... That's that dude. It's like, and there are like five, six different people, two of his old managers, too. Man, that's that dude. Oh, what did he do to you? Let me hear this one. Oh, yeah, he was supposed to pay you X amount of dollars, you know, spent all that time with them, and he stiffed you or shorted you. And, you know, the managers say, oh, and he tried not paying me, and yada, yada. And um, it was like a broken record. It just kind of showed the guy's character, you know. I don't know about you guys, but let's ask all your old buddies of like 10, 20 years what they think of you. And I don't know if they all say you're an asshole, then it's probably true. <laughs> yeah. Maybe just don't ask them just to be safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep, so yeah. on, on top of that too, um, I was getting inducted in the hall of fame with Forrest last year. And it was like, it's not something I like campaigned and begged for. It was like, Hey, guess what? They're going to put you and Forrest in the hall of fame. Oh, all right, cool. You know? So I go there, it's at the expo, and I got my booth and talking to fans, and then everyone's coming up. Oh, did you hear what Cheeto? Did you hear what Cheeto? Cheeto, 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 Cheeto says you don't deserve it. Says you got no business being in there. Says so bullshit. Like, oh, okay. Like, you know, you couldn't wait till like, you know, a couple days later to, to, you know, concern your disgust for their decision to put me in there. You gotta like make it vocal on the day I'm getting put in there. It's like, okay, my day to, you know, okay cool, collect a nice little plaque and get a round of applause, whatever. Like, that's an honor, I'll take it. And then if someone tried to take a, a crap on that, kind of pissed me off. Mm-hmm. So, Absolutely. and also, just coming up in the sport, I remember back fucking, oh, sorry about the language. Oh, you, you can gosh, say whatever you want. We're in, we're in Australia, Stephanie. We pretty much do whatever we want. <laughs> Sweet. Sweet, yeah, that's how it should be. You know, <laughs> if you don't like us words, change the fucking channel. <laughs> so, you know, I... he's, he's always like been a guy I didn't like. I thought he was disrespectful. I thought when he beat Kai Metzger and flipped off Ken Shamrock, it was disrespectful. I, I thought when he like beat Evan Tanner, Evan Tanner's laying there. It looks like he's hurt bad. 
completely not move and he's digging him a grave. Like, that's disrespectful. Um, you know, after he beat Kenny, where the shirt that said, I killed Kenny, very disrespectful. After he beat Vito on a split decision, he let, they easily could have went to Vito, or he just got it because of the takedown. And they ran around parading around the arena like, you know, he was the greatest thing ever. Then he talked a bunch of crap to Chuck, who had already knocked him out. And then when Chuck got up and said, dude, like, really? I'll knock you out again. Then he said, uh-oh, uh, let me beat up someone, call out someone I know I could beat up. Then he called out Ken Shamrock again, so I called him Slam Cop. Just tons of real disrespectful behavior. And on top of that, I always thought he was boring. He's had good fights, but they were because of the other guy. Because the other guy was able to stop takedowns or get up off the takedowns and hit him in the face and make it exciting. If they're up to him, he'd just hold every guy down for dear life. That you know, throw little elbows and then hold on and make sure he doesn't stand up and win rounds. And um, Yeah, that's, to me, that's not fighting. So... And I pissed him off. He says he's going to fight me like a man, and we'll see if he's a man of his word. You know, speaking of rivalries, you know, um, you have a nice little alliance happening with Justin McCauley. Now, we're just wondering, you know, um, how did you guys uh, get hooked up? How did you guys come together? Obviously, he, he's the big mystery masked man, but people don't really know much about him. So tell us, what's his issue with Tito Ortiz? And um, are you guys working to get together? He's been with him for a number of years. I first met him back in Jungle Fight in 2003 in the Amazon in Manaus, Brazil, um, when I fought Machida. He fought on the same card. Mm-hmm. And even back then, he had been trained with Tito, and oh, yeah, you know, I helped Tito get ready for his fights and Big Bear and yada, yada. Uh, so they go way back. And, you know, five, six years later or so, I, I see him, um, you know, in his corner when he's beating up Shamrock, and I see him. I see Cheeto in Justin's corner when Justin's fighting in the UFC. So, I mean, obviously it just tells me they're friends of a long period of time. And then uh, um, a little over a year ago, like w- way before um, this fight was even thought about, I think even before the Hall of Fame thing, like I called some fights with them for the RFA. And uh, and I was like, oh, yeah, what's up with Cheeto? Is he going to fight again? I know you two are good buddies. And he gave me that sour look and said, man, I'm that dude. And I was like, oh, here we go again. What did he do to you? And, you know, of course, like every training camp, he'd say he'd, say he'd give Justin X amount of dollars for, you know, leaving his family and spending a couple months there training with him. And he'd short him. And, uh, and there's some other things, too. But, uh, yeah. He said, "Up that dude. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, I don't want to hear on that. Like, you know, it's like, it, it kind of makes me sad. Oh, God, you know, you guys were together all those years and great friends, and now you had a falling out. It kind of sucks, you know? And I didn't have anything with Tito then. And, uh, yeah, then when this fight, um, the possibility of this fight came up, he uh, got a hold of me and said, I'd love to help you get ready for him. You know, I know Tito better than anyone. And, uh, you know, I've been in a ton of his camps. So what do you say? Hell yeah, come on up. So he's been up here with me, uh, helping me train for this. Now, Stefan, we saw a video, uh, I think it was the other day, you were getting interviewed, uh, you choked out the interviewer. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to lie, the guy looked like a troublemaker from the get-go, so, you know, it's probably a good decision. Uh, but we're also glad that we're on the other side of the world, so it's not going to happen to us. We noticed that Justin's still wearing the mask. Question is, how come Justin's still wearing the mask? We know who he is now. He's not, he's not the mystery ninja anymore. His point in wearing that mask is, Anyone could be under there, a number of people, you know, one of a hundred. Mm-hmm. It's pretty much that Chino goes and does the same thing to, uh, you know, that everyone who steps forward and helps him out. Um, he's selfish. He's a self-centered person with a huge, huge inflated ego and really does everything he can to protect that ego. And that's what is, is so inviting and, like, gratifying about taking this fight is look, he's the one who's got to win it like he has all those fans he's the icon he puts himself on this up on this pedestal like he's this great supreme being and uh dude he's got to beat my ass and he's not gonna and then afterwards when he sees just a regular dude whooped his ass like his whole world's gonna crumble Cause I'm like I'm the opposite. I know I don't think I'm some icon or up on this pedestal. Like I'm really no different than anyone else. And uh, yeah, I've never been that like 
that, that type, and I think that's why I dislike his personality so much. We're such polar opposites. But you're very modest, Stefan. You know, you're, you're one of the biggest icons in MMA. Now, um, you mentioned that you had a number of surgeries, a number of broken bones. Okay, so let's go to the moment you realize you're going, getting back in the cage with Tito. It's going to be a huge fight. Obviously, you mentioned you've been doing your trading, and you've probably been training casually, but you know, nothing getting ready for a fight. Now you're back in the gym, like you mentioned. You're getting ready for this bout with Tito. Tell us, how's the body feeling? Obviously, it's been a while since you've had a hard training camp going into a fight. How's the body feeling right now? How does it feel to be back in training and getting ready for another bout? I'm actually right on right on pace. I'm right where I should be. Um, you know, every week I put myself through, you know, uh, as much as uh, my body can handle. I'm pushing myself till I vomit and then some. And, uh, and every week it gets a little better and a little better. And right now I got four more hard weeks to push. I just put in a real good week. And I won't lie, like, uh, my shit hurts. I'm sore as hell, and it got, like, arthritis, and I ice all the time, and Celebrex before bed. But I've done this many a time. I could suck this up for another month and train my balls off and be in pain. I've done it for years. So this is this is nothing new. It's just something where I was kind of sick of going through. I, I know I could push and always, uh, you know, I broke my toe, like, couple weeks ago i haven't missed a workout you know it just hurts tape it up and push through it and that's how i've always been it's really no problem it's just unless it's like something as rewarding as a fight with tito where i could go and put on a show uh, yeah i'm not so motivated to go through that crap you know just for you know regular run the mill fight so this this was a blessing i was blessed with this opportunity so hell yeah um i don't care what hurts on me i'm gonna suck it up and push through it and and deliver. Awesome. Now, uh, you know, obviously we can't wait for the fight. One thing I wanted to ask you, Stefan, is obviously you guys, you and Tito, you, you're squaring off November 15th, Bell Tour 131. The card is looking good. You know, you've also got a big fight between Will Brooks and Michael Chandler as the co-main, and King Mo versus Tom DeBlas is finally happening. And of course, uh, an exciting fight between Melvin Manhoff and Joe Schilling. Now, you guys, however, will be competing against another event on the same day. Of course, your, your previous employer, the UFC, have a card that day too. How do you feel about going head-to-head -head with them? Um, honestly, like, um, at first wasn't going to be like that. What was it going to be on the same day? It uh, wasn't until the, the night, you know, where me and Tito got in the cage and I talked shit about Jen and whatnot. Um, that's when I found out they were, they were going to put it on the same night. But really, yeah, I, I won't lie. I kind of was like, whoa, at first. Like, really? Like, see what the UFC heavyweight fight? Then I thought to, you know, most of my friends and family, and what cheapskates they are, and most of them would much rather watch something on free TV than have to pay <laughs> 50 bucks. Uh, you know, Stefan, you just mentioned that you had a broken toe in training. I'm just wondering, how severe is it? Do you think it's going to affect the fight in any way? Because I believe that's news. Nobody really knew that you had a broken toe. Oh, I made it through the worst. So I really have to break the bone, you know, uh, whether it's a little foot bone, a hand, or a toe. Um, those first two weeks, right after you break it, oh, those are the worst. But after that two week mark, it, it starts getting better. And uh, it's been about three, three and a half probably. And just yesterday, Fitch is uh, is uh, teaching the pros class at One Kick Next Gym, and uh, we even did a conditioning circuit where we had to do box top. And I was like, "There's no way I'm going to be able to do this." And uh, and I was able to do it. And, um, oh, yeah. yeah, so I made it through the worst, and it's only getting better from here. Yeah, absolutely. And do you think it'll affect you at all come November 15th, or do you think it'll be completely healed up? Do you think it'll limit you from oh, doing no, anything big, in the fight? Big, big, big bones take about six to eight weeks to heal, like, say, the humerus or, you know, bigger bone. But little little fingers or little foot bones, even hands, four to six weeks. And it'll be four weeks, I think, on... Thursday, so yeah, uh, I mean it's already feeling good. So uh, it's, it's not going to be a factor at all. Like I'll be kicking full force with it from the fight. Wow. Now, Tito said, uh, Tito was on our show a few weeks ago, and he said that he plans on taking you down and punching you with elbows. You know, it's a recipe that he's used in the past and it has brought in some success. How do you plan on stopping and nullifying his wrestling? Well, I'll 
to what I've been working on. Uh, that's the first thing I started working on since I heard about this fight. That's what I'm working the most. So, uh, yeah, we all know his plan is to, to squeak out a decision and uh, fight me like a coward. So I know that. So I'm going to stop his takedowns and, and make, him, make him fight me like a man. Yeah. So I'd shut his takedowns down. If I do get down, pop back up and uh, make him fight me. Now, Stephen, you know, the big iconic fight, obviously, in your career was the finale of the first Ultimate Fighter against you and Stephen Bonner. It was something that changed, you know, MMA. It, it, it was one of the big first successful nights the UFC ha- had, and a lot of people attribute the UFC being around now to that fight. You know, we go back forward now to 2014, and you and Tito Ortiz are fighting which, for a fight which could be one of the biggest fights, you know, in Bellator history. How does it feel for you to have another opportunity, you know, to help a company sort of get to the next level. Yeah, it feels like everything's coming full circle. Like this whole fighting career is this, uh, I mean, in, I say this parenthesis from top one finale to this fight with Cheeto, but really, uh, I mean, go back to my first fight in 2001. I'll go back to, you know, doing Taekwondo as a little kid and wrestling. Um yeah, I've been a martial artist my whole life, but yeah, my you my MMA career uh, started in 2001, but really that the first parenthesis mark is that fight with Forrest, and who knows what the last one will be? Maybe you know I'll get offered another big money fight after this. I don't know. Um, I can't say what I'm gonna do after this fight with Tito Ortiz, but I'm just gonna go in and 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 deliver and yeah and try to top that Forrest fight. And make Gio fight me like a man, make it exciting, and just throw tons of punches at him until he, he's out of there. Or, you know, if he happens to, 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 to take all the punches, I don't congratulate him at the end of the fight. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's my plan. It's no secret. Make it a barn burner. Bring the chaos. I get you know what, you, Stephanie. You sort of half answer that um, my next question just before, but I want to know. So, like, in terms of after the Tito fight, do you have any plans on continuing to fight, or are you just not sure and undecided at this point? Um. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm really not thinking about that at all. I got something big going on with the trading in January for a month, and. uh that'll definitely be the main focus from January to February. Then I'll take it from there. Now, Stefan, we let the Aussie fans know you're coming on the show and they sent through some fan questions, so we'll ask you a couple of fan questions if it's okay. Sure. Okay, well, the first question we have from a man called Will K.O. Will would like to know, do you think that Vandalay Silva deserves to be inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame? You know, are you kidding me? That guy was the pioneer before I even drew the nutsack to step in the cage myself. I was watching <laughs> Vanderlei going, holy crap, this guy is amazing. Like, I love the way this guy fights. Like, if I could fight like anyone and just bring the utter violent chaos, it's Vanderlei Silva. So, hell yeah. Now, uh, Adamant wanted to know, as far as other fighters go, what are some other dream fights that you wanted to see that never happened? Just from a fan perspective. Um, me and Forrest coach tough. Oh, and then, yeah. of course, beat the crap out of each other one more time. Yeah, that would have been awesome. Yeah, and I, I know you... That, I was, need, so, that was uh, a big dream. I was convinced I, I, I was convinced it would happen. It was just something I could talk Dana into, but couldn't do it. And, you know, you know, that was something that everybody sort of wanted to see happen as well. I think that would have been great for tough. I, th- I think they really missed the ball with that one. Um, we, we have a question here from uh, San Nick the Pick, and he'd like to know, you know, obviously um, you versed Anderson Silva once, um, and it was a bit of a difficult fight. Looking back on that fight, do you think he should have approached the fight with a different strategy? Um, if he had another opportunity to rematch him, would you approach it in a different way? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you got to understand, that fight I was... Uh... I pretty much got my retirement letter. That's when I was asked. In February, I was asking Dana, to, me and Forrest, the coach. He said it wasn't happening. Even Ariel Alwani called me out on live TV, and Dana said, hey, he came in the office. I told him that wasn't happening. We were under the understanding that he was retired. I got my retirement letter from them in March. Uh, July came around, and um, they actually offered me a position, and I was an employee and working for the UFC. Get health insurance, and when you're an employee for the UFC, you can't fight. You can't do both. Mm. 
mm. that stepped down from fighting, was working for the UFC, getting a paycheck. And then in uh, September, um, that UFC real card totally fell apart. Like the co-main event, main event, um, had injuries. And, uh, yeah, I remember Jose Aldo injured himself on a scooter. Yeah, <laughs> and there's yeah, another yeah. one. <laughs> and uh, they, they were going to cancel the show. Um, and really, like, Anderson stepped up and said, oh, well, okay, you know, I'm, uh, I'll step up and uh, take a fight to save the show. And they offered him some names. And uh, from what I heard, he's like, oh, Stefan, that sounds like a fun one. And, uh, and then I got the call. I, I really couldn't believe it. You know, it was like, no way. Like, really? Um, you want me to fight Anderson? When? You know, um, well, in a couple weeks. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> uh, like, damn, like, I wish I hadn't been retired. Uh, anyways, so, yeah, if I could have done anything differently in that fight, it'd be like, uh, you know, train a couple months for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think most people would approach an Anderson fight that way. Now, Stefan, we know you're a busy guy. There's just one more thing we want to do with you. It's called the Submission Radio Tap Out Round that we do with all our guests. Basically, throw a bunch of fun questions at you and you answer them with the first thing that comes to your mind, kind of like word association. Are you ready? Yeah, I really suck at that, but go ahead. That's all right. <laughs> our first question, will you be dressing up as Justin McCulley this Halloween? No. <laughs> Anderson Silva versus Mick Diaz. We want a prediction from you, Steph, and who wins and how? Damn. I don't know. I'm kind of thinking Anderson, just more polished striker, more tools, but, like, Diaz is a cardio machine, and, like, you know, there's a chance he could wear him down and take the fight late, but I'll go with Anderson. Okay. Now, your Punch Buddies t-shirt line is awesome. Are there any plans to release any new t-shirts? Not really. Um, been making some event shirts for, you know, when UFC travels around to different cities and countries. But uh, as far as the Punch Buddy shirts go, I um, discovered, like, you know, uh, how hard it was to make to make money with it. You know, you, you got to really hustle to sell those shirts. And then from your profits, you got to invest most of it back into print shirts and websites and whatnot. Mm. And, uh, just kind of the whole trading thing ruined it when I could just play around like I'm playing a little game of high low and and make some money that way it was like oh um why am I like tearing my head out getting these shirts printed and shipped and you know waiver sign and royalty checks and then it just yeah that ruined it now, Stefan, when you brought out Justin McCauley uh, in the big announcement of Bellator, our marketing division decided to come up with some other alternative surprise people you could have brought out with you. We have a list here, and we want you to choose out of your favorite one if you could choose one more person to bring out with you. Okay, so I'm going to read out the options. We've got Bob Sapp. So, sure, Tito never had anything against Bob Sapp, but having Bob Sapp next to you would have been a very nice moment. We have, you reveal the mask, and it's Chuck Liddell. Chuck Liddell's always had a rivalry with Tito, and he could throw his phone at Tito's head. We've got Forrest Griffin. Tito and Forrest have unfinished business, and you and Forrest work together to take Tito out. Or well, finally, you take the mask off, and you have Dana White standing there. Dana White, nothing else needs to be said. Which one would you choose? I'll choose E, none of the above. I would bring out Jenna Jameson. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Good answer. Uh, now, Stefan, is Tito Ortiz the kind of guy that would eat the asparagus tops and leave the rest in a jar for everyone else? Oh, wow. I think Tito's selfishness goes to a whole different level. Um, I think Diego is just so focused on himself and whatnot. I mean, it's different. Like, put it this way. I've been out at the club with Diego, and uh, for one, he doesn't come up and, and, and charge me to help chip in on the bottle. And if he did, I totally would ship in on it. Um, but I would be pissed off if I later found out that them bottles that he always gets from this particular club were always being comped. And he's hitting his friends up for money and profiting off of them when he gets bottles comped at a club. Wow. I'm sorry. That's just Tito Ortiz. Another story. Another story. <laughs> Ouch. I mean, now, what kind of guy? Imagine your friend doing that. How low is that? Wow. Well, we have, we have a couple of friends that might do something like that as well, so we know how you feel. <laughs> now, uh, Stefan, 
you worked a little bit with Dave Batista when he was in MMA. You've had a bit of sparring with him. Tell us, how would you rate Dave's skill set in MMA? I mean, Dave had one pro fight, and he went through hell. He went through a hell of a training camp for it. And, like, I'll say just perfectly, yeah, his wrestling and his grappling game is pretty good. Like, like he's got a nice, fast double A, heavy chop game, um, good back control, and uh, really, it's uh, he's wrestled in high school. He wrestled all those years, so of course, that's the area of his game that's the strongest. The striking game, although not bad, is is the one that uh, just like everyone else, strengths and weaknesses, the one that would need a little more work. Now, second last question, Stefan. You know, you're the American Psycho. That's your nickname. Uh, you know, and it's an iconic nickname, too. However, the Submission Radio Marketing Department just come up with three potentially new nicknames if you were so inclined to choose them. Uh, so from the following three, which would you choose? We've got the Wolf of Cage Street. We've got Sir the Bonnie what? the Third. Oh, Duke the, of wolf, the Wolf of Cage Street. That's good. Yeah, he's thinking about it. Sir Bonner the Third, Duke of Cornberry. Think about that one. Or bad news, Bonner. Cornberry. <laughs> Cornberry. Yeah, I mean, I don't know where where it is anyway, but it, it sounds really sophisticated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have no idea what that that part means. The first one was pretty good. What was the third one? Bad news, Bonner. That's not bad. Macaulay's other one for me is big bad Bonner. That's big bad Bonner. Cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind of bad news, Bonner. Big bad. Yeah, I would think as a pro wrestler, bad news Brown. Yeah when I hear that one. The Big Bad Bonner, kind of similar there. I like them both. Fantastic. And now, finally, Stefan, give us your prediction. How are you planning on fin finishing Tito in your fight at Bellator 131, November 15th or 16th here in Australia? Yeah, I'm psychologically, for me, um, I visualize what's going to come out of my mouth in the post-fight interview, which is usually going to be good. And I visualize just hit them repeatedly in the face. Not necessarily fixed out with the outcome. Not necessarily visualize, you know, like what strike takes them out ultimately. But just hitting them over and over. And my victory speech is what I visualize. So I get that question a lot. What's your prediction on how you're going to take them out? I'm going to savor every time I get to punch that bastard in the face so much that that's what I'm visualizing. Well, there you go. We can't wait to see it happen, and we can't wait to see your post-fight speech. Guys, you can follow Stefan on Twitter, at Stefan Bonner. Make sure you follow him. A lot of great stuff happening on Twitter leading up to this fight. And, Stefan, you know, it's an absolute honor to have you on the show. Obviously, me and Cass, big fans of yours. And we look forward to seeing your return in Bellator. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Go Roosters. And here's Madeline Silva, the ex-mother, and you listen to me on Submission Radio. All right, guys, our next guest is an American Nationals black belt gold medalist, an Asian Open black belt gold medalist in the absolute weight, the Nogi Pan American black belt gold medalist, Brazilian Nationals black belt silver medalist, New York Open black belt gold medalist, weight and absolute, and a Boston Open black belt gold medalist. As you can see, he's he's done a lot of things and accomplished a lot in his career, and he's going to be fighting Rory McDonald at Metamorris 5. He's none other than JT Torres. JT, welcome to Submission Radio. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. I'm doing pretty good, and I uh, really appreciate you guys having me. Yeah, oh, it's absolutely our pleasure having you on the show. And uh, we're obviously very excited about seeing you compete against Rory McDonald at Metamorris 5, but the matchup almost didn't happen because you originally wanted to be a basketball player. Now tell us, at five foot seven, why did you want to be a basketball player, and how did you originally get into BJJ? Um, you know, I I have always enjoyed all different kind of sports, and one sport I really enjoyed, and I still enjoy watching and playing a little bit here and there, is basketball. And I try to play basketball for my school. I got cut from the team and all that, cause I, you know, it wasn't good enough. And uh, I was kind of just hanging around, not doing much. And actually, my father is the one who pushed me to keep doing martial arts. And I stumbled across Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu when I was a young kid, 15 years old. And ever since that day, I've been going strong with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I fell in love with this since day one. Well, that's, that's very good, JT. And, you know, to the untrained eye, you look very laid back on the mat. But you have a rather aggressive style, um, which makes for very exciting fights. If you could, how would you describe your style of Jiu-Jitsu? 
Um, I would describe myself as a jiu-jitsu of like uh, being like a bulldozer. You know, I'm always trying to go forward. You'll never see me backing up or, you know, trying to run away. I'm always trying to bring the fight. And, you know, I'm never, I'm never afraid to bring it, you know, where some people I know like to tie up or like to stall it out. You know, I'm not afraid of losing. And that's one thing that holds a lot of people back. And I just go right for the kill. And, um, you know, I like to look to push the, the action and have some fun out there as well. And that's exactly, you know, that makes you the perfect fit for, a, you know, a place like Meta Morris. And uh, this will be obviously the fifth Meta Morris event. You obviously competed at Meta Morris 2 against Victor Estima. You know, the match went to a draw. We saw you in Estima's guard for the majority of the match. How did you find the event in general? And what was the biggest you, thing you learned from it? Well, you know, what I found from the event itself, it's, it's a great event, well run. And they're really treating the BJ athletes like high-level athletes that they should be treated like, which was really cool to see and experience myself. And I've never fought a match like that where it was just 20 minutes, submission only, that's it. That's the only way you can win. But it changed up a lot of things, especially for someone like me who competes a lot, but I used to compete a lot in tournaments with points, um, time limits, a referee that gives you a decision or not, uh, sometimes three referees for one match. Mm. So it's a little different where... With these other tournaments, you're always constantly thinking in your mind, points. It's almost like a math equation. Where at Metamoris, the only thing you have to think about is submitting the guy. And that's something that's sometimes more difficult than looking for points and all that, without a doubt. Especially fighting another high-level guy for 20 minutes who's trying to do the same thing. So really, it was a cool thing to experience because I had to switch my mindset from one type of tournament to a different type. And I'm lucky to have that experience from Metamorphs 2 bring it into this next Metamorphs match. And I think it's going to help me out a lot, actually. Now, now in terms of your matchup against Rory McDonald at Metamorphs 5, uh, could you ex explain to us or give us the background? How did this all come together? How did this contest come together? And you know, how familiar were you with Rory before this match got announced? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it all came together with... Uh, you know, a Facebook message, actually. I got a, a Facebook message from Halle Gracie, um, and he asked me if I was interested in fighting in the Metamorphs 5, and I said, absolutely. I said, who do you have in mind? And he said, you know what, give me a few days. I'll get back to you. Uh, I'll let you know a few a few options I got for you. So I said, okay, great, cool. And a few days later, uh, he said, what about Rory McDonald? And at first, I was like, Rory McDonald, the UFC fighter? And I said, wow. I mean, I was a little surprised because I mean, Rory's a great MMA fighter, obviously, but I always see him dominating with strikes. Mm. So I never really thought of him of a, of a grappler, which I know he still has great grappling skills, but, you know, he really portrays his striking. So I was like, wow, this is interesting. I said, okay, yeah, absolutely, let's do it. And, uh, yeah, that's how it came about. I'm actually really excited, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what happens, you know. I'm, I'm excited to see what Rory comes to the table with, and I know I'm training hard, getting ready for the event. Now, it sounds like, you know, when he mentioned Rory, you knew who he was. Are you a fan of mixed martial arts or just predominantly BJJ? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, fan, I'm a huge fan of both. You know, I, I follow MMA and obviously Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but, uh, yeah, I'm a huge fan of both. And I'm actually a fan of Rory, you know. I've watched, I watched his last fight, I think it was like two weeks ago, mm. and you know, I was actually rooting for him, you know, and I really do think he'll be the, the champ one day very soon. Um, I have a lot of respect for him, and... I enjoy watching him fight. And uh, speaking of his last fight at UFC 178, we're just wondering, what did you think of Rory's death stare? Um, <laughs> I liked it. I liked it. <laughs> you know, I, I liked it because I, I, I like to do the same thing, you know, where uh, I like to look into my opponent's eyes and, you know, when they look away, you know, they have a little bit of doubt. So it just shows me that Rory is game, you know, and he, he, he wants to bring the fight and – I feel I perform to my best when the other person comes to fight as well. Mm. You know, that, that's when they, they open up themselves super for mistakes to be taken advantage of. And likewise, you know, for my, for me too. But like I said, that's what makes the fight fun to watch and to fight, you know. And now uh, Coach for us Zahabi of TriStar recently said that BJJ is just one of the things they do to train for MMA. You know, it sounds like they're very confident they will be taking the win. Given that you don't do any MMA and BJJ is your primary focus, do you think that will give you an advantage against Rory at Metamoris 5? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I think I have the advantage in the technical side 
where I think my technique is more refined than his. Um, given, you know, I know he's a black belt. I know he's got his black belt in no gi jiu-jitsu and all that. But, um, you know, I think our, our the mindsets are trained are, are differently, too. You know, they're trained to be different where, you know, he finds his opponent in a vulnerable spot and he wants to bring down punches and knees and elbows where I'm looking to lock in the submission. So just the, our thought process, I think, will be a little bit different. And, uh, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I, he's got good grappling, but like I, like I said, I, I think I have the advantage on the technical side. Also, he's bringing in a size advantage, which makes things interesting as well. I, I think I'd be giving up almost well, maybe a little bit more than 20 pounds. So, you know, it's going to maybe even things out. I don't know. Only one way to find out, right? <laughs> uh, tune to the event. We'll have to. Now, you know, for us, yeah. Harvey, for us, Harvey, he's a great coach in MMA. However, you train with some uh, amazing guys yourself. At you know, at us academy, yeah. including Keenan Cornelius, Andre Galval. You know, what what's it like training with Andre and Keenan? And you know, how much confidence does that give you uh, going into a contest such as this? Uh, you know what, it gives me a lot of confidence actually, because those two guys are obviously two of the best guys in the world, if not the best guys in the world right now. So I get to train with those guys day in and day out, seven days a week. You know, so. It's it's only making my game better, having those guys sharpen my tools. And actually, Keenan probably has a similar body type to Rory McDonald, which helps me train, mm. and she helps me train for that specific fight. And also, you know, Andre, Professor Andre Gaval, he's around the same weight class as Rory, but so is Keenan. So I have two very high-level guys around the same size as Rory to help me prepare. So it, it's going to help me immensely, I believe. Yeah, I was just wondering, you know, you, you're talking about your training and, you know, some of the stuff that you guys do. Uh, me and Casper, you know, we, we're casual Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys here in Australia. You know, we, we might train, you know, two, three times a week on a good week. But, you know, I've heard some crazy statistics about the amount of training that, you know, professional Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, artists do. I'm just wondering, what's a typical training schedule like for you? How many, you know, how many times a day do you train? Um... Hours a day, um, you know, I would say for me, it's like a full-time job. So I would say a good eight hours a day, I'm at the gym. Wow. You know, I'm obviously I'm not training all, the entire eight hours. But for example, we'll train two hours in the morning. You know, I'll go get lunch or whatever. I'll rest up. And then I'll either be lifting weights for an hour or drilling for an hour. Then I also teach classes. I teach the kids classes and instructing. I, I firmly believe is another form of training because, just me explaining techniques reminds me of the essential parts of all the techniques. So that's a, a re refreshment for my own mind. And then at night, another two hours. So you add it up, you know, you almost got eight hours of mat time altogether. So it, it's like a full-time job, you know, definitely is. That's crazy. Now, uh, in terms of Rory, you know, if you could just sort of sum him up, you know, maybe on like a graph, what would you say Rory's biggest strength would be? And what would you say his biggest weakness would be coming to this match against you? Um, I would say his, his biggest strength would be his, his, his uh, aggressiveness and his size. Um, and then I think his weakness will be... Oh, that's a good question, actually. You know, he's a, he's a he's a very good athlete, very good athlete. You know what? I'm not sure what his weakness is, but I'm going to go out there and force him to show me what the weakness is. Mm. And, you know, JT, obviously you mentioned that, you know, Rory, he's primarily an MMA guy, uses his striking a lot. Does it put any pressure on you in this matchup, you know, knowing that, you know, you, you, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it's your world, and, you know, Rory's coming to sort of test your skills. Do you feel any pressure going into this one? Um, no, to be honest, you know, because he, he's a, a world-class actor himself, you know what I'm saying? Just like, oh, we just an example, if you take a, a high-level Olympic judo player and put him with the best jiu-jitsu guy, you know, it's still going to be a, a tough match for both guys, you know, it's just, they're both world-class athletes, and you throw them in together, and it's going to be a battle either way. So, I mean, it doesn't really put pressure on me, I... I I, I try to avoid putting pressure on me. I just want to go out there and focus on what I'm going to do and not worry about any outside pressure coming in and just go out there and do my thing.
Yeah, of course. Now, uh, it, it's becoming pretty common for a lot of guys, you know, to come in from MMA and headline these grappling competitions like Meta Morris, who obviously saw Chael Sonnen, you know, Josh Barnett, even uh -huh. Dean Lister. You know, what do you think about a lot of these MMA guys coming you know, to BJJ comps and headlining these submission grappling events? I think it's awesome. I think it's great for the sport. I think it's great for the MMA world. I think I think it's great for the BJJ world. They're only going to help each other, I believe. Um there's some MMA fans out there that are not very educated on the grappling aspect of things. So when they mm. see these big UFC MMA fighters coming in to do a submission only uh, fight, they're going to be they're going to be interested to watch, and they they'll learn about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they'll learn about submissions, and vice versa. You know, uh, big UFC names coming in to do grappling matches, the BJJ fans are going to be interested to watch them fight in the UFC fights one day down the road. You know, so. I think they're both great for each other, and they're they're helping each other out grow. Now, now, JD, you know, you recently suffered a nasty injury in training where you ripped your third and fourth toes apart. Um, just to tell the yeah. listeners at home, how did that happen? What exactly happened there? And so I was uh, I was training. I was actually training for the Nogi Worlds, and I was feeling great. Um, and I actually went for a foot sweep, and my partner was stepping back as I was going for the foot sweep and the edges of my toe hit his ankle and which just split the two toes apart because I went for the foot sweep pretty hard. You know, I went with it 100% to try to hit the takedown. And, yeah, I just split them open. And, honestly, I didn't realize it at first. I kept training. I kept, you know, we were still on the feet training. And then I just felt the, you know, the warmness of the blood. And I looked down and it just looked like a crime scene. So I was like, whoa, what just <laughs> happened? And, uh... It was actually a clean cut. You know, I had, I got 13 stitches and, uh, you know, I couldn't fight the Nogi Worlds. I had to sit out and I just had to let it rest up. But, you know, I'm back to training now. Of course, I'm taping the, my toes just to be safe. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it was a nasty little injury. But, you know, thank God I'm back on the mats and I'm training hard again. Yeah, I was going to say, how is, how is the foot now? Will it be 100% for, for Metamoros 5 against Rory? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, right now I'm already training hard and I'm back on the mats and I still got a few weeks until the fight, so it'll definitely be 100% by then. Now, JT, you know, it's no secret that you uh, were coming on to, to Submission Radio, so we've got a lot of fan questions for you. But before we jump to those, we have one last question for you ourselves, and that is, you know, the event is obviously headlined by Sakuraba versus Renzo Gracie. We're just wondering, could you give us a prediction? Who do you think is going to go out on top in that one? And how do you feel uh, about being on an event like this one and being on the same card as these legends? Um, I think... Henzo Gracie will come on top with the win. Um, I just think Henzo Gracie has been more active in recent years than Sakurawa has been. So I'll give the advantage to Henzo for sure. And once I found out that Henzo and Sakurawa was the main event to the to this event, I was so excited to be a part of it. And just to watch those two legends go at it, I mean, I'm a huge fan of both guys. I grew up watching both guys fight and some of the toughest guys I've ever seen in my life. So I'm super excited to be on the same card, and it's almost like a dream come true. You know, I was a boy watching these, these guys fight back in the day, and now I'm fighting the fight right before them. It's crazy to me, but I'm super excited. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Now, JT, we obviously told the fans you're coming on the show, and uh, obviously the BJJ community is strong around the world and in Australia. We've got a few questions okay. from the fans. So I'll kick it off with this one from Matt Blitz. Uh, he basically said, you know, you posted not too long ago a quick clip of some heavy dumbbell bench press. What are your favorite lifts to perform for jiu-jitsu, and what are your personal best for them? And he follows it up with, would you consider posting more footage like that for future strength and conditioning sessions? Yeah, so what I like to do, I, I like to lift heavy. Absolutely, I like to lift heavy. Um, so I'll, I'll just do basic workouts where just bicep curls, uh, bench press with dumbbells in the bar, uh, squats, just the essentials. I, I think you can't go wrong with those. And I believe you should do those a few weeks out before your fight. And then I'll see if three weeks before your match or your tournament, you change it up. You start doing uh, lighter weight higher reps and more cardio based uh cardio based workouts where more sprints more running and less heavy lifting but like i said a few weeks before out you build that power and then when you're close to the fight you build the speed in the cardio 
And now just in terms of Matt Blitz's question, what are you able to tell us your personal best for, say, I don't know, bench press and squat? Yeah, um, the heaviest I did on squat was 335, I believe. And wow. I think I can go a little heavier. And then bench press, I believe my highest was 245 so far. <laughs> so I'm building that up little by little and, you know, trying my best. And on top of that, you know, it's just, it's also challenging because, I'll train just in the morning, hard, then go lift in the afternoon. I'm already half tired, so it's like a whole another sport, weightlifting in itself, you know, so yeah. it's fun. It's challenging. You know, JT, I have a fan question actually for myself because I'm a fan of you. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, yeah. obviously I mentioned, you know, me, Cass, and a lot of the uh, Australian listeners listening right now in, in New Zealand, um, you know, the big question comes up in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu communities down here. You know, what's the best um, dieting, you know, when training hard for Jiu-Jitsu? Uh, I'm just wondering, a person like yourself, do you use many supplements? Are you more of a natural guy? Well, you know, what, what does a meal plan look like for a JT Taurus? Um, meal plan. So, yes, absolutely supplements. You need the supplements. I mean, when you put your body through that, you need to refuel it with good, 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 good stuff. So, you know, I like taking, I take, for example, vitamin C, fish oil, a daily multivitamin, um, a glucosamine pill. Um, I, those are the pills I take. And then I also take something called Endurox, which is like a, like a hybrid between Gatorade and a protein drink right after training. Um, and then Kill Cliff, I like to drink. I have a, a great sponsor, and their name's Kill Cliff. And I, I drink their uh, recovery drinks after training, before training, um, sometimes during training, and they have these great protein bars. So that's what I'm usually doing supplement-wise. And then food-wise, I try to keep it very green, um, broccoli, avocado. You know, it's a lot of salads, a lot of lean meats. I like the chicken. I like beef. So I'm not really trying to cut my food out. I'm always still eating good large portions but just eating very clean i try to avoid the pastas and and the butters and the cheese and the breads and all that and just keep it more natural very nice now uh another question from fu man 299 he wants to know he's got two questions what have been some of your bjj epiphanies and how are some of the challenges and advantages a smaller person faces in bjj uh, that's a good question um i would say I would say there was a – back in 2010, I believe, I went down to Brazil, and I, I, I was fighting the Brazilian National Championship, and I actually had a match with uh, Leandro Lowe, and another great BJJ fighter, and I actually lost the match by an advantage. You know, it was a close fight, but I lost by an advantage. And after the match, you know, I, I thought to myself, you know, I trained hard. I felt well prepared. But what, what happened to me there? What happened in the match that I couldn't get the victory? And what I came to the conclusion was that you just got to, like I was talking earlier, mentioning earlier, you can't be afraid to lose. You know, when you're afraid to lose, you will lose. You know, so you just got to go out there and pull the trigger. And it doesn't matter if you get hit while doing it, but you hit right back harder and stronger. So, you know, that's the way I, that's, that was my big thing for me. I was just, when I turned the corner, I said, you know what? Should I go out there, win or lose, I'm going to pull the trigger, go for it, take the risk, because sometimes uh, the risk is, is worth taking, you know? Mm. We we'll have an interesting uh, fan question here from Pat Sally 98 and you know I'm, I'm pretty curious to uh, hear your answer on this because I experience this very often myself sometimes when I'm grappling. How do you deal with a loss or, or a particular tough day on the mat? What, what do you do in that? Because you know that can be pretty tough mentally you know, in, in jiu-jitsu. And the other question he had for you was, what was your favorite belt to be at? Where did you feel you, know, you made the biggest leaps? That's a good question. So, I mean... We all have our good days and our bad days, without a doubt. And even even the best black belts in the world and the best MMA fighters in the world still have their bad days and good days. And the way you gotta take those those bad days, you gotta take them in a good way. You gotta take them where, you know, you're gonna tell yourself, you know what, if today was a bad day, but now I know what I have to work on. Those bad days actually teach you more than the good days. I I honestly believe. So you know what to work on in your next training session the next day or what to go home and review, you know, in your mind or review through your notes and you take notes after training. Um, so that's, that's to me how you should definitely handle those bad days. And now as far as my, the belt where I felt I made the most leaps and bounds, whew, I would, you know, 
be honest with you, I would have to say black belt. You know, uh, I've been a black belt almost six years now. I'm actually coming up on my sixth year. And since I've got my black belt in 2009 to this point, I have improved day and night. And it's really true what they say. You know, the journey really begins when you get that black belt. So I would say definitely black belt is where you learn the most. That's crazy. There's blue belts out there that are like, I've been doing this for years and the journey hasn't begun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got you to gotta stick through it. You got you to ride, ride the adventure the whole way through. Now, here's a funny question from Zombizzle1. Have you seen the documentary on Rory McDonald's day-to-day -day life? It's called American Psycho. It details his flawless morning routine and his strength and conditioning program, which consists of doing 1,000 sit-ups every day. Actually, I have not seen it. I have not seen that. <laughs> well, it's actually got Christian Bale in it, and it's it's quite a riveting watch. So if you get a chance, <laughs> have a look. I imagine there's many similarities <laughs> to Rory McDonald, and I could. Oh, I'm going to check it out for sure. <laughs> in all seriousness, no, JT, we've got one more thing for you. It's called the Submission Rate Tap Out Round. We love to do it with every one of our guests. It's basically a fun part where we discover a few more things about you. We fire off a bunch of fun questions. It's kind of like word association. Just answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. All righty. What is the most important thing to remember when training jiu-jitsu? There's always going to be water after a round. Makes a good BJJ coach. Always there by your side, win or lose. Who was an idol of yours when you've always looked up to? Jacare. What's your go-to move? Back takes. Nice. Your diet is very important to you. You've always seen, also we've always seen that uh, your, your missus is a very good chef and kind of like your nutritionist. What's your favorite thing that she makes? Grilled chicken breast. Was her nice specialty secret salad? Oh, uh, yeah. Ooh. Now, you know, <laughs> we watch the countdown to Metamorris. We see that you're a gamer. Have you had a chance to play EA UFC and beat up Rory McDonald yet? <laughs> I have not. I should do that, though. I have not done that. Makes for great <laughs> practice for the mental side of things. Now, um, obviously, yeah, right. clean guy, clean diet. When you do have a cheat meal, though, what is it usually? What's a guilty pleasure? Ooh, muffins. Well, there you go, guys. I feel like we have learned a lot more about JT Torres. You can follow him on Twitter at JT Torres BJJ. And don't miss out as he takes on Rory McDonald at Metamoros. JT, it has been an absolute pleasure. I feel like I'm going to play this interview in my gym so everybody can just become better by listening to it. Awesome. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. It was an honor to be on the show. Man, the pleasure is all ours. Absolutely fantastic having JT Torres on the show. Can't wait to watch him. Meta Morris 5, him versus Rory McDonald. Of course, Sakuraba versus Henzo Gracie and a whole lot more action. I always look forward to the secret match in Meta Morris. You know, those things always get me excited. You never know who it's going to be. And uh, I'm pumped for this one. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, they did a good job with Meta Morris. Really, you know, bringing grappling competitions to the next level. A fantastically organized event. And, you know, I think we're very honest when we say we are very excited to see what happens there. And, you know, that wraps up the show for this week, Cass. And a big thanks to Ben Saunders, uh, Martin Campman, Stefan Bonner obviously had a lot to say. And JT Torres for popping onto the show. Cass, like you mentioned at the start of the episode, we have a, a big interview coming out with Carl Noak. It's a really fun one. That's going to be hitting the channel soon. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be coming out in the next couple of days. Like we said, Carl's going to pick a brand new look. He's going to pick himself a new nickname. And of course, he chats about, you know, the Akiyama fight, what happened, his injury, a bit of an update, how he's doing in general. And I believe he's got a bit of a shout out to young Jake Matthews, who we'll be having on the show soon. So, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed it, hit subscribe. We'll be back same time next week, uh, same place. Of course, check us out on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher Radio, or, of course, here on YouTube. Uh, can't wait to do it again, Dennis. Any last words for the fans? I sure do, Cass. One last thing to say to all the fans out there. Who do you think will be walking out the champion or the winner, I, I should say, between Sakuraba and Renzo Gracie? Comment down at the bottom of the video and let us know how excited you are for the next Metamorris event. And while you're at it, why not tell us what your prediction is for Stefan Bonner versus Tito Ortiz? You know, Stefan was on the show. Tito was on the show a few weeks before as well. Tell us what you think. Give us your predictions. Give us your ideas. And we'll catch you next week. Thanks, guys.